Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to the program. This is the Jeff Gerstman Show. I'm your host for this week's edition of the show. My name is Jeff Gerstman. It's May 2024, and uh, we've solved the problem. Finally, we've got it done. We're on the other side of it now. Uh, it, it was a messy road to get there, uh, but we've finally got all of these pesky human beings out of the loop when it comes to making video games. We've paved the way uh, for the AI to step in and take over, and uh, it's great. We're going to tell the computer what to make, and it's just going to make it. And it's going to be awesome. I, I have a... You know, I mean, there'll still be people involved. I mean, you know, the humans have to write the prompts. I mean, for now, right? I mean, uh, it, it'd be nice if we could just have like, you know, maybe some kind of algorithm that watches a stock ticker and Google trends. And when a certain thing crosses this line and it goes like, well, Dishonored 3, what do we, th you know, and, and, and when these things meet in the middle, then the prompt is written Dishonored 3 comma, I don't know, comma, immersive sim, comma, you can teleport, comma, it's okay, comma, rats. And then, voila! Video game magic happens on the other end. It's uh, great. It's from, the, uh, it's, it's from the makers of Speed... No, I'm not even going to drag the fine folks at Speed Tree into this. Oh, man. Um, interesting morning. In video games, I guess I would say, in terms of uh, layoffs that have overshadowed some layoffs that happened a week ago. Um, but we'll talk about both of those. Uh, Hades Two is out in early access. Let's start with so let's start with something that actually feels good. That actually feels like it has like. So many little touches of humanity, humanity all over it, uh, that it is a feel good video game. Um, I had a great run last night. I, I have, so I, you know, I played a bunch of the technical test and, um, the technical test was, you know, basically kind of the first area of the game. Right. So, so restarting the game in early access, I was like, okay, all right, now I just got to do this again. And, and I, got through that boss fight much faster and made it onto the second area and, 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 uh, and all that good stuff. So I've, I've been playing Hades two kind of off and on the, 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 early, I say the full version, but it's in, in early access. I've been playing that version of the game for about a week now. Um, and, uh, but I've been playing it off and on because, you know, it was, it was repeating a lot of the technical test stuff and I was like, okay, I gotta just gotta get through this. But I finally had a, a what felt like a great run. You know, you have those like anomalous runs in some of these games sometimes where you just get way further than you ever have before and you keep going and keep going. And you're like, oh, my God, this is this is going great. It's never going to be like this again. <laughs> like I'll never get this far. Like it's not like the next very next run. I'm going to get even farther. Like this is like some freak things happened. I got a really good build going. Everything is headed in my direction. Um, and so I made it to the end of the second area and did not, did not beat that fight. But I, I will say, um, the second area in that game, I think is amazing. And the boss fight that you find there is fucking rad. It is so cool. Um, and and other than that, it's Hades. You know, hey, it's it's got more weapons than the technical test did. I guess I shouldn't compare to that because it sounds like not a lot of people or a bunch of people didn't get into the technical test. So I guess it's maybe that's not a meaningful comparison for people. But um, but yeah, the 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 second area and finding uh and and, and kind of seeing the other weapons that I have yet to unlock. There's an axe and I believe a hammer. Um, and and kind of going through and and getting the resources to to start to get ready to unlock that stuff has been been very exciting. It's uh it's a hell of a game. I you know when Hades 2 got announced it was kind of like not a it was weird, right? Because that studio has never really made sequels to any of their games and and so a lot of their stuff has just been like okay, like there's a a through line in terms of 
um, narration and and style of of dialogue and music and 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 there's there's a lot of stuff there that I think you can you can look at the super giant catalog and and kind of plot the the similarities there where it like like hey the, these these games feel like they're coming from people that have a very particular point of view about how they think games should be made and they're applying that to games in different genres as they go and that's been really interesting to see. So going from Hades right into Hades 2 um, felt a little weird at the time. But uh, I, hey, <laughs> turns out turns out Hades is really good. And turns out, uh, hey, uh, a follow-up to Hades. Um, more story in that world and um, new characters and a new, new dialogue. Like, like all of that stuff has been very, very welcome. And so it's been nice to kind of settle back into uh, the world of Hades and kind of see what has changed and see, you know, what uh, what we're going to do to fix it, I guess, is is kind of the the overall story <laughs> of, of of that game. Um, and it's been really wonderful. Uh, it does have me wondering, like, man, I wonder what, you know, cause, because the studio, like Supergiant has come a really long way. Um, I mean, there's certainly a larger team now, um, but it just got me wondering what would a sequel to Bastion, like if they were to make a new Bastion in this day and age, meaning three years from now or something, when, uh, Hades two is done and dusted and, and, and out the door and whatever else, like, I was like, Hmm, I wonder what a sequel to Bastion would actually be like, um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, anyway, I, I don't necessarily um want to spend a ton of time going blow blow by blow through it I, I put up a video of the technical test and, and the game still looks a lot like that so if you kind of want to see the basics of the hub and and some of that early game stuff uh that's there um but it plays fantastically and i think the changes made to the combat in terms of how your ranged attack works uh i think are are phenomenal and uh and now that I'm getting better at using all of the abilities and, and, and mixing and matching that stuff and, and finding builds that work for me, um, I, I'm, I, I've been having a, a really, really good time with it. Um, it's in early access. I think it's on Epic, but it, it is definitely on Steam. Um, you should check it out. <laughs> um, hey, the follow-up to f fucking Hades. Guess what? It's, it's good who could have guessed right um but also like I, I guess like that that's not necessarily a given right i you know it would be very it, it's believable the idea that like oh here's a sequel to hades and all oh, the things they changed or whatever and this is too much the same and this is too much of this like it, it, it's it's easy to see a world where um a sequel to hades is maybe not the the right thing at the right time or whatever but it turns out like i I think they made the right call here. I, I don't know. I don't know what the, if I wonder what that discussion was like. That's a question for, for them that maybe we'll uh, get to ask one of these days here. Um, is like what, you know, was it like a very obvious move to, to go right into Hades too? Did it, was everyone just like, Oh yeah, no, we have, we have to make more of this. Or was it more of a, Hey, we've got these four ideas on the table. We think that this is the right time for this or that, you know, like what's the, you know, the, what was that decision making process like? Um, regardless of all that, I you know I think I think what's out there now is really good. I can't tell you how long it is because you know, like I said, I'm only in the second area. It sounds like that the content they've been on this game for a long time, so it sounds like the content that is available currently in early access is like at least as much as was in all of Hades One or something. And I think they still have one more major area that they're promising um, to to put into the game as well as more. More, I guess. More, more. Um, so yes, give it a look. Um, it's it's a phenomenal feeling game, uh, and it remind you know it reminds me of like the the thing that is missing. Hades, I think, was influential. Um, I think we see a lot of games that are also still in early access that have come along in the wake of a game like Hades and have tried to 
you know, it's, it's it's one thing here, it's one thing there, right? It's like, hey, here's um, uh, you know, here's a game that has a, a very uh, you know, when when the when the gods come up on screen and give dialogue, it's a game that has that, you know, it's a game that looks like it has that pulled from Hades, or little little bits and pieces of that game have like sprinkled their way out into a lot of other indie games. But I think the thing that The thing that always sticks out to me when it comes to what Supergiant does goes all the way back to Bastion. And that is that idea of a narrator um, or, or a centralized voice, um, most often a narrator, that helps you in ways that you know, like like there's a lot of games have dialogue right but there's a subtlety to this dialogue in terms of the things it is telling you um like Hades doesn't really spend a lot of time um telling you what the names of all the enemies are you just walk into a room and your character says like uh floaters or whatever they are you know like like tells you the name of them right there in context, in universe, and you learn it right there. There's a menu you can go dig into and, and dig it out of there if you want to. But um, the other thing it does is when it will point out that you you are like, oh, I got farther than last time. Like when she says it, and, and, and that happened in Hades 1 as well, it's that idea of like the characters are in this with you and the characters are reacting to the world as it is without, you know, a bunch of video gamey layers that would make it weird for them to comment on that. Like the story is written in such a way that her repeating the task makes sense and blah, you know, um, and all of that is acknowledged and having that work as a, as a commentator, you know, wh whether it's coming from your lead character or coming from narration or, 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 you know, sometimes a bit of both. Um, I think it's a way to keep you in that world while also keeping you informed about that world. And I think that that is one of the things that I think a lot of, I, I don't hear that in a lot of voice acting in other games. It's not to say that that acting is bad or whatever, but you know, like the, the voice acting in a lot of games, I feel like it doesn't. I can't think of very many other games that have tried that. I mean, the thing I go back to is I think this is, you know, I think it was when Pyre was coming out. Um, and, and, you know, and in talking with them about their games over the years and stuff like that, it was that kind of that moment of like, oh, you know, like NBA Jam. And you're like, oh, oh, you're viewing the, okay. Like you're viewing the narration in a, in a way serving as purpose somewhat similar to a commentator in a sports game or something like that, right? And 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 that made a lot of it click. Um, where you're like, oh yeah, huh? Like the commentators in sports games are are kind of giving you that situational awareness, whether it's you know, you know, when when you get that last shot near the end of the game, he will come on and say the nail in the coffin, like the the very situational type of stuff. And I think a lot of Super Giants games have done things like that um, really well over the years. And it's not something you hear in other games. It's not really, you know, like there are plenty of games do barks and situational awareness and all this other stuff. You know, when you throw a grenade, Snoop Dogg says, throwing grenade. You know, Tommy Chong comes on and goes, throw in a lethal or, you know, whatever the fuck he says. Um, but it's kind of not the same thing, you know? Uh, and I guess in, in that way, for as much as I think that Super Giants games have become known for their voice acting in terms of just like the straight up quality of it and the quality of the writing and the, and the quality of, of that dialogue, I think there is also that aspect of the game, of the games where the dialogue is put to work in a way that a lot of other games don't. And I think that's, outstanding and I think Hades 2 continues to do that um, and I think that's one of those like kind of signature things for them 
when I think about their games, that is something I think about. Um, that is that is something that I it feels like that they that they nail just about every time. Um, and I think that that's really neat. It's really neat for you know like studios don't ah, maybe they do. I you know like studios don't feel like they have signature styles the way that they some do some don't i don't you know like it, it it's the i think a lot of smaller yeah yeah i don't know there, there's yeah i i i'm you know that's that's not a fully formed thought but I, but i think the thing that they do with voice and voice acting um and the way that they use it and the purpose that it serves in the context of their games or the the multi purpose that it serves in inside of their games i think is really um, astounding when you when you sit down and, and and see what it's doing and look at it like it's 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 really it's really really great. Um. So yeah, I don't know. Hades two, you should check it out. It plays well too. <laughs> it's not just it's not just a a fun informative announcer. Uh, it, it's it's awesome. Um. Okay. In the news, man, okay, this story comes to us from IGN.com. Microsoft has decided to close uh, a handful of Bethesda-oriented studios, ZeniMax-oriented studios, whatever we want to call them these days, uh, including Arcane Austin, the developers of Redfall as well as the Dishonored franchise. Uh, Tango Gameworks, the studio behind Hi-Fi Rush, as well as The Evil Within. Um, along with Alpha Dog Games, the studio that made Mighty Doom, which is a, a cute little mobile uh, game with the Doom license that uh, was neat, but, eh, you know. Uh, and uh, another studio called Roundhouse Games, is going to be absorbed into ZeniMax Online Studios, which is the studio working on Elder Scrolls Online. I don't remember what Roundhouse did. Um. Oh, is that the is that the former fucking human head? Yes. Oh no, wait. Okay. Yes, kind of. Actually, it is the 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 entire team at Human Head formed a new studio called Roundhouse. Um, but they hadn't shipped anything, uh, under Zenimax. The last thing they shipped was Rune 2 in 2019. So, um, so I, yeah, I think maybe they were already, were anyway, they're going to be absorbed into, um, the Elder Scrolls Online team, I guess, um, This is, um, so the, the further statements, the, the public facing statements, which both have the eerie look of, like they, they, it's, you know, JPEGs posted to Twitter, but they both have the same, like very corporate formal, uh, Zenimax or like Bethesda, like font and treatment and stuff. And so both of the statement, like, it's kind of weird. Anyway, Arcane says, Today it was announced that Arcane Austin will close and development will not continue on Redfall. To everyone that has supported the work from our Austin studio over the years, thank you. Thank you for spending time in our worlds and making them your own. Arcane Leon will continue their focus on immersive experiences where they are hard at work on their upcoming project. Which I believe that's Blade, right? Uh, Redfall players who purchased the Hero Pass as part of the premium Bite Back edition or the premium bite back upgrade will be eligible to receive the value of the upgrade. While there will be no further updates, Redfall's servers will remain online for players to enjoy. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's it for Redfall. 
Uh, the other statement out of Tango Gameworks is today it was announced that Tango Gameworks will close. Thank you to everyone that explored the world's rec recreated Hi-Fi Rush along with Tango's previous titles will remain available and playable everywhere they are today. Um, so look, th this is terrible. This is terrible. Um... Also, I would say that Redfall obviously did not do the numbers that they thought it was going to do. And at some point, time, whether time got away from them or whatever happened, like the updates to Redfall to quote unquote fix it were a long time coming. Um, and presumably that then pushed back their DLC schedule. And so at a certain point, is anyone left to play Redfall as they put resources into fixing it and so on and so forth? That said, I think that a studio that has been, that managed to become known for a new IP back in, you know, when, when the, the Dishonored franchise came along, it was kind of this breath of fresh air sort of thing. And, um, they became very well known and very well regarded for that franchise. Um, there was at one point a dishonored three on the books. I don't know if that was necessarily like the thing. Um, but like that is what arcane kind of largely became known for. Um, And I'm trying to make sure because they split the games across the studios. Um, like Deathloop came out of Lyon, right? Yeah, Deathloop came out of Lyon. Redfall came out of Austin. The Dishonored series was largely kind of, I think, before they split, right? Like that before they they became multi-team. So Dishonored 2 was mainly developed by the Leone office, but Harvey Smith was still the director. Um, okay, so that's kind of weird. Because, okay, Harvey Smith was the director of, of Arcane Austin. But then when it came time to do Dishonored 2, he directed Dishonored 2, but that was being developed in Leone because the Austin studio was working on Prey. Okay. Um, and then Dishonored 1, all the way back in 2012, uh, looks like it was just kind of the whole of Arcane. Like there, you know, Leon was, was on that as well as, um, as well as the Austin studio. Um, Right. I, I remember that. I remember that being weird now, now that I, I think about like the Dishonored 2 stuff and like, okay, Harvey Smith is going to run it, but it's being developed out of Lyon. And then Raphael's going to stay and do Prey. And then he's going to leave. He left like not long after that, if I remember right. Um, so. <sighs> look. So. The thing about this stuff is we do not have all of the go forward information about what these studios may have done. Um, and that's always a big if like, what was the next game that arcane Austin was pitching to make? Was that a meaningful pitch? Was that a pitch that it seemed did a lot of people leave after Redfall, putting them at a point where they would have had to staff up uh, greatly to to even make another game? You know, had enough of the team left, was enough of the team burned out and, and, and on their way out that, like, if you have to look at reinvesting a full game's worth of money and marketing and everything else into Arcane Austin, is that a safe bet? Um... We don't know. I don't, that's not me saying like, oh, they couldn't have got it. Like, I, I, I don't know. Um, 
Hi-Fi Rush, Tango Game Works is a, is a is, that's a tragic situation. Hi-Fi Rush was an award-winning release. It was a beloved release. It was a feel-good release from a publisher, Microsoft, that desperately needs games like that. It's the sort of game that when they pitched Game Pass as being a thing that was like, oh, this is, you know, this is going to make it safer for some of these smaller games to exist because Game Pass is going to provide that kind of cushion and blah, blah, blah. Um, so, okay. That's it, I guess, for that. And, and Tango's other works, The Evil Within and Ghostwire Tokyo, uh, certainly had their fans, um, and uh, if we go back to, there was a document uh, re released in 20, or, or I guess it was, it came from 2020, but it came out of, uh, it was a Microsoft pitch deck that was uh, dated from an era when they were looking at buying ZeniMax and when they were looking at doing this deal. So it was them looking at the development slate for what was going on over there. And, um, and then that came out. I think that that pitch deck made its way into some lawsuit filing or something. So that's, that's why we we have it now. Um, it has a, it has Ghostwire Tokyo sequel written on it and it has Dishonored 3 written on it for fiscal year 24. Um, which obviously the, the dates are way, way, way out of whack. Um, so, I, you know, I guess the only thing, the only like, I'm trying to like logic my way through this. And trying to make it make sense. And the only thing I can think of is that uh, Tango Gameworks was a studio that had a staff size that required a larger number of, like a bigger game than Hi-Fi Rush to come out of it in order to make, you know, keep its, you know, keep its books looking good, right? Um, and so Hi-Fi Rush was something that was like a big surprise from seemingly a smaller team or seemingly a smaller turnaround uh, as something that they were working on kind of between things almost. Um, and so maybe the thing there, and, and, and this, this slide also has kind of the revenue forecast for these games where they were looking at Ghostwire 2 to make 90 million, Dishonored 3, 90 million, Fallout 3 Remaster, 190 million, I mean, if you want to fucking like take the, the cynicism train all the way to its logical destination here, uh, if the forecasts are saying that a remaster of fallout three will do better than two sequels, uh, to relatively newish IPs combined, then what the fuck are we even doing? Why are we, why is anyone making a new game ever? What the fuck? Like shut it the fuck down. Um, You know, Elder Scrolls Online was projected to make more money in fiscal year 24 than either Ghostwire 2 or Dishonored 3 by by the look at this uh, admittedly ancient forecast. Um, Hi-Fi Rush was a um, phenomenal game. It was one of the best games to come out last year. And so if we're currently operating... If game developers, not we, if game developers are currently operating in an, env in, in an environment where they can make an award-winning, one of the 10 best games of the year, BAFTA-winning video game, like Hi-Fi Rush, have it be a wonderful surprise, have it be a hearts and minds success for a platform holder, which a, a platform holder is supposed to be able to cushion a few more blows than the average publisher. And so if a platform holder can't look at their platform strategy and find a fucking hole for something the size and shape of Hi-Fi Rush on a somewhat regular basis, what the fuck are they doing? What is all of this? Why... Why would you work in video games 
if you can go out there and make something that is critically acclaimed, a, a game that like Microsoft, that Xbox level executives went out and defended when, when a narrative spun up about like, oh, well, Hi-Fi Rush doesn't seem like it sold very well or whatever. Like Microsoft, a company that is very good at saying jack shit when it wants to and being like, well, we don't com or comment on rumors or speculation. They made sure Aaron Greenberg made sure to get out there and say, no, fucking we're thrilled with how Hi-Fi Rush did. We think it's, yeah, we're fucking stuck. Like, like, if all of these things can happen and you still can't quite find a way to keep some form of this studio together, what is anyone doing? If a game like Redfall can come in and be impressed upon you, like, if the... Mm. From the studio that brought you Prey. A game that people fucking loved the shit out of. If you cannot find a way to make that work. If that has fallen apart to the point where it makes sense, it makes more sense to just shut it down. I think, yeah, at some point, the lesson, I think, to the people out there working at game studios, you know, becomes like, hey, there is never, and and, and maybe this was always the case, and, and, and I mean, certainly this was always the case. There is no such thing as job security. You can work on a great game. It can win awards. Uh, you can make all the right calls. Uh, it can go on and sell fine, uh, and uh, and you can all get laid off anyway. Like that, that seems like the lesson out of this. Um, and so, why would anyone at any Microsoft-owned studio feel like they have any sort of job security? right now and and again with the environment being what it is maybe no one feels like they have any job security out there in game development because it's all completely fucked across the board um but like what's the reward on the like hey congratulations you shipped an amazing video game and you know like when perfect dark comes out let's say perfect dark ends up being good which who knows is it still going to have cost so much to get that studio up and running and blah, blah, blah. Will the, will the target that it has to hit in order for that studio to stay open, be so unreachable that they're the next to fall? Like what, you know, what's the incentive to fucking stay there? Why would you work for Microsoft at this point? If this is how these studios are going to get treated, uh, you know, like the Redfall situation is, Interesting too, because it because Redfall became something of a focus, and it shouldn't have. And maybe if it hadn't, maybe this wouldn't have happened. But be, but Redfall kind of got a bullseye painted on it for better or worse. Um, like there was a variety of finger pointing, and then like, oh no, it was on us. Maybe we should have had a closer look at um. Maybe we should have been keeping a closer eye on the studio at Arcane. We hadn't really, you know, we we let them do things their way, and which is kind of a still a weirdly backhanded way to talk about that game. Um, when Microsoft did finally come out and start to address it, uh, yeah, I like who's to who's to actually blame for this stuff. Ultimately, and then that's the stuff we can never know, you know, like, hey, maybe on the ground, uh, some bad calls were made about the next project, maybe the pitches for the next projects, you know, hey, maybe, maybe Ghostwire Tokyo, maybe they took a look at how well Ghostwire Tokyo one did and thought about like, uh, if in fact, the the current running pitch, or pre production or whatever was a sequel to Ghostwire Tokyo, I don't I don't know, that was what was on that document. But that document is four years old now. And who knows, right? Um, but maybe the next pitch from Tango Gameworks after Mikami leaves and whatever else, 
Uh, maybe they take a look at that pitch and they go like, nah, this doesn't really fit with what we're trying to do. This isn't really, this isn't really a game we want to, that we want this studio to produce and maybe we can work with them to produce this. And, and either way, you know, neither of the, I would say neither of those sequels an evil within three or a ghost wire Tokyo two, neither of them set the world on fire. Um, neither of them seem like they are, would be destined to be massive, big hits, but also I would say the exact same thing about Hellblade two. And Microsoft has persisted, uh, on, getting behind that game in a way that personally I find a little strange. I don't know. I, I've been voicing these views and did not get invited on the last cycle of previews for Hellblade 2. So I can't tell you one way or the other. Um, but, uh, you know, Hellblade 2 will eventually come out and will Ninja Theory get shut down six months later? Is it going to be some big game changer is it going to is it going to change Xbox's fortunes is it going to come out and they're going to be like that's it game pass is, is even more you know like like is Hellblade 2 going to move the needle again I don't even want to talk about the quality of Hellblade 2 here it could be amazing but I, I just like that style of game the thing that they're promoting the thing that they are pushing the thing that that game appears to be I think has a ceiling um and it is not something that feels like it is destined to be the next big mainstream success or whatever. And not every game needs to be that. But also you just shut down studios that seemed to be making games that were sort of in that lane. Um... I, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I wonder if there is like a meaningful shift happening inside of Microsoft. If they're like, hey, we need to get back to. We need to get back to the bread and butter type games that that made us in the 360 era. Is that why there's talk about new Gears of War being announced in June? Finally, is, is are they just like going to circle the wagons and be like, fuck it. Halo Gears Forts a fable. I don't think those games get the jobs done, the job done anymore. But also they have Call of Duty, so they don't have to care about any of that stuff, right? Or or do they? I you know the larger Microsoft position is really strange. You know, we just had their earnings call. You just had uh, Nadella out there talking about, well, we're the we're the top publisher on PlayStation. Like that's awesome. I guess I don't know. Is it like I? You know, are, are you going to start acting more like a regular publisher? Because layoffs like this feel like a regular publisher embracer group type moves, not platform holder type moves where the platform holder says, hey, we need a wide variety of games on our platform as a platform holder. You know, like uh, games like Hellblade 2 and, and games like a Ghostwire Tokyo and some of that other stuff, I think, make a lot more sense as part of having a healthy, widespread portfolio. But, you know, at some point the push and pull of having a wide variety in your first party portfolio butts up against, does anyone actually want these games? Um, and I think that's, that's sort of a rough thing that, that, that these studios, I think maybe got caught up in to a certain degree. Dishonored has always been one of those franchises that's been beloved, but it's never been like a breakthrough smash success. Like one of the best selling this and that. And, you know, if they're looking for games that are going to be that, which maybe they are, maybe they're not. I, I don't. Um, I don't know what Microsoft is looking for out of a game studio or out of video games. I don't know what they're looking to put on the Xbox because it's been so long since they've put things on the Xbox that it just feels like a mystery. And I don't get the impression that they know either. I think they have found their way into owning a ton of these studios and they acquired some, some big studios along the way. And so they've got shiny new toys. You know, like when you acquire something like Bethesda, what are the top three studios you're looking at in that, that hierarchy? It's BGS. I guess it's id. And maybe ZeniMax Online, because the Elder Scrolls Online is just kind of a known quantity that's just kind of over there turning the crank and, and making some money. 
Like, are you looking at the arcane studios at that point as being more of like a, well, we really just wanted the next game from Todd Howard. Um, and whatever we else we get out of this, that's great, but we're not going to go out of our way to go to bat for some of these other locations because ultimately all we care about is getting Starfield. I'm like, hey, well, you got Starfield. Um, I've been the, the add in throw on, I've, I've been the free thing in a sale before it sucks. It doesn't feel good when it's like, Hey, someone came in and bought this. And, uh, and we sold and you're, you're, we threw you guys on the pile too, because it would be weird for us to keep a game site after selling all these other ones. <laughs> and, uh, none of it feels good, but also it's a really good way to ensure that your new owners don't give a fuck about you. And so I wonder if that was sort of the situation, um, <sighs> None of this feels good or right or feels... None of this feels like video games are heading in the right direction. None of this feels like we're really, uh, you know, hey, it's a tumultuous time, but like if we see it through to the other side, like none of, none of what's happening right now in video games feels especially good. Um, the obviously the the layoff conversation has been ongoing for a very long time now this isn't necessarily a new one but it's it's the cuts feel deeper and weirder in ways that just like you like i thought we were i thought you were in this business in this video game business to make video games but like everything keeps getting pushed back and studios are getting shut down left and right and Studios that are not, you know, like relatively recently acquired, you know, the, the, in the case of the Bethesda stuff, like, you know, that's still a relatively recent acquisition to just be like shutting down whole teams and being like, yeah, yeah, we're good on this. We're just gonna, uh, we're just gonna have a, a, a one of those file boxes, one of those white cardboard boxes, and we're going to write the word dishonored on it. And we're going to stack it here in the back, right next to the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, we're just going to close this up and, you know, whatever. Um, this makes me feel, you know, actually like way fucking worse about the Activision acquisition. Um, in terms of like, hey, there's a lot of uh, Activision IP that you could, in theory, tap into for new games. And someone wrote in and, uh, you know, we were talking about Pitfall not that long ago. And like, what the hell would you even do with Pitfall? And someone wrote in and said, "You make a search action game with it. You you make you you make a pit, a Pitfall Metroidvania." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I guess that's actually kind of exactly what you would do with that, isn't it?" Um, that would probably work reasonably well. But yeah, I don't know. The the this stuff just it, it's it's the, the the business of big video games. Big video game has never felt more broken. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't know where this stuff goes from here, but, but I, I think about it in terms of like, Hey, you know, if, if you thought like that, maybe Microsoft was going to like dust off some Activision IP, like, no, even the more recent IPs, like they didn't even give a fuck enough of a fuck to follow through on a dishonored game you know and dishonored to me always felt like a fairly safe sequel to make in terms of you know probably what that game's going to sell you're probably not going to get it to be some massive bigger thing at this point but it's got a very dedicated fan base that would be excited to see a third game bringing those games to game pass might get more people into it and, and get more people on board for a new game in that franchise. It's, it's a modern B game, I guess, if we have to look at it like, right. I mean, it's, you know, um, but yeah, I don't know if you're working at a studio owned by Microsoft right now, like what, you know, what's the, All you can look at and go like, well, they didn't shut our project down and we've spent enough money now that they're probably going to have to let us see it, see it through. 
Um, but then on the other end of that, what's next? What does Microsoft actually want out of video games? I can't tell anymore. I, re I really can't. Um, but when I think about the future of video games, when I think about the, 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 the future of Microsoft as a company, more than just Xbox, and I think about the way that Xbox aligned with the company's corporate values, that starts to feel even worse. Um, because, you know, Microsoft wanted to become a big services company. And so, you know, Xbox leaned into services. They leaned into Game Pass. They already had Xbox Live Gold. They already had, you know, all of this stuff. And, and they, they became a bigger services company. Subscriptions, all of that. Um, and now Microsoft is one of the dominant companies pushing all of this fucking AI trash. Like at a, at a high level, corporate level, they've made massive investments in companies like OpenAI. They want AI to be a thing. Despite every single fucking AI thing coming out either doesn't fucking work. You know, like that fucking rabbit thing. Like the, it's a fucking joke of a product when they try to sell something. Or it's a hilarious joke because the only fun thing you can do with AI is like, ha ha ha, we listen to this song. I made on it. I typed this in. And this came out the other end. Yeah, BBL Drizzy. Listen to this. It's fucking hilarious. Um And this is what the company is, you know, like like so many companies are are like basing their entire future on like this thing that it doesn't really seem like people actually want and it it just feels like the grift moved from NFTs over to AI so smoothly and everyone is so dumb slash like the, the like investment theory that no one wants to be left behind. Like, Oh, well we got to make sure that we invest in AI because everyone else is investing in AI. We got to make sure we lay off like 8% of our workforce because everyone else is laying off 8% of their workforce. We don't want to get left behind. Otherwise the investors will have questions and we don't want to have to fucking deal with that. We don't want to actually, have to think a way for our like we don't have to plot our own path through this mess let's just figure out this other shit and so everyone has like crawled up their own ass with all of this AI shit um that isn't doing anything right now like none of like all of it is based on like the future of like well this stuff is gonna fucking blow you away but like every single place that this AI shit gets deployed, there's always a fucking problem. There's always some hilarious broken bit. There's always some bit to it that you're like, oh, well, yeah, you didn't think all of this all the way through. And now your chat bot is giving cars away or, you know, like all of the little things along the way, because everyone is in such a horrible race to push out the fucking most dog shit. Like we used to have this idea of a minimum viable product as something that was like usable and like largely functional and would at least sort of do the thing that you were trying to sell it on. But in the world of AI, it feels like that's just gone out the window and they're just like pushing out garbage all the time. And it's, that's fine if you're like, hey man, look at this weird open source thing we're making and you fuck with it and you're like, well, this isn't here yet, but that's really neat that you're doing this. Like that level of AI and like fucking around with it and downloading this open source thing and compiling it and running it and doing this, it's fascinating. But the rush to productize it and the rush to try to commercialize some of this stuff is embarrassing. And these are from companies that have been around long enough that you would think that they would know better than to like fall for this fucking like weird song and dance. Like Microsoft is not a, you know, oftentimes not a smart company. They're slow to move. They're very tribal. They're very, you know, Microsoft is Microsoft. Like people go work at Microsoft and then they just vanish, right? They just, they just become one of those guys. They just like, I'm a Microsoft, I'm a, a Microsofty. I don't know. Um, But like the race to just in over invest in all of this incredibly embarrassing shit. Like you just see it from a fucking mile away. 
Anyone with half a fucking brain that's been on the internet long enough, that's been around the tech industry long enough, like you see this stuff and you go like, you're not, no, no, this isn't like, yes, could this be a thing someday? Sure. But like, this isn't something that anyone should be talking about. Like Apple was out there this morning talking about all of their awesome neural processors going into the new iPads they just announced and how they've been doing AI for a good long time. They've had neural processors for years. All the other guys are catching up. It's like, yeah, well, I don't know. Fucking Siri can't even fucking do the right thing half the time when I talk to it. So I don't know if I'd be out there fucking bragging about your AI bullshit. Because it's been trash. And I, the thing is, is I don't think people necessarily want it to be better or care enough about it. They're not there going like, if only this was better. They're like, no, I don't need that. I'm, I'm fine. I don't need that. No, you don't need to like, you know, when Apple puts out phones next year and Siri gets like a, an overhaul, you know, in, in iOS 18 or whatever it is when they're like, now, well, we can do all this on device processing and do all this sort of stuff. I like, okay, that's cool. I, I don't need that. I don't need that. I open up an application and I look at it like Siri is usually good enough to read a text message that came in while I was driving a car. That's about it. I don't, <laughs> you know, like I don't need like, no. And, and, and it's not just me being like, well, I'm an old man and I like to use a mouse and keyboard. It's I, the demand does not seem like it is there for that. This does not seem like it is the way forward for efficient, modern computing. Um, I don't need a bunch of on device neural processing to t tell Siri to fucking like wake me up in 20 minutes because I put a drink in the freezer and it's faster to say, wake me up in 20 minutes than it is to say, set a timer for, um, it's, uh, it's fascinating, man. The, the tech world, the, the, like watching like that rabbit R one thing come out and be basically a dog shit Android app that fucking doesn't do a goddamn thing that they loaded onto this shitty little Android device and tried to say it was, no, this is a custom thing. You couldn't just, like, bullshit. People fucking made it run on a phone. Get fucked, losers. I say losers, but they have probably raised millions of dollars in funding that they're paying themselves in and smacking each other on the back and going, ha, 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 yeah, well, we'll get them. They're the product. This review, not real positive. Do you see that shit? Not to just, you know, fully fucking sidetrack here. But the review of that Rabbit R1 that came out um, from, I don't remember the dude's name. Was it Marcus something? Um, like he wrote a, he put up a YouTube review of, of uh, Bra yes, Marcus Brownlee. Yes. Um, put out a review of this Rabbit thing, which was an AI device. It was meant to be like you clip it to your shirt or something and it's got a, a, a shitty little screen on it. Um, and, you know, you can, I don't know, talk to it or, or whatever. Um, he reviewed that thing and said it was bad. So it was like the, you know, one of the worst products he'd ever, I think, I think the language was the worst product he'd ever reviewed or something along those lines. And there was like a cadre of people. And that dude, I, I don't, I don't really, I don't follow his, his work too. I just know that like the general consensus that I have seen is that he is a, he's like a relatively light touch on a lot of stuff. And doesn't necessarily go in and um, and tear things apart, and doesn't necessarily tear things down as as a rule. Like he's uh, you know like a a relatively um, even handed guy, I guess. Um, but like this review hit, and then you have all of these fucking tech bro, like not even tech bros. It's like the tech bro hangers on that are like on Twitter all the time and, and, and just like people going, I can't believe that, you know, that you would tear down someone's work like this or do that. Like, or, you know, the thing doesn't work. The thing doesn't do what it's supposed to fucking do. That's what reviews are for. People want to spend money on a thing. They want to know if it's good or not. They, you know, like the idea of a review is to provide that service. The very idea 
that are reviews like, oh, you should have let it. Why would you do this? Why would you tear down this product in this nascent space that we're trying to grow this, bro? Um, those people can go fuck themselves straight up. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. That's what reviews are for. The ideal, like review, reviewers are in place to help people make smart decisions about what they buy next and hopefully save them some money. I don't know. That, that dude has had like, like the last time that dude kind of came up was when he reviewed the cyber truck and was like weirdly nice to it in a way that just made the whole thing sound super fucking suspect. So the idea of going to that dude and being like, why are you being so harsh? It's like, I don't know, man. Did you see him kind of like white glove, soft touch the, the cyber truck a little bit while saying it's bad, but it's like, oh, it's still okay. It's like that DJ academics dude trying to maintain that Drake is not so bad. Like, no, I listened to it again. And no, this is, this is fire. I'm pretty sure this is actually fire. Like, fuck off. You fucking idiot. You sound like a total fucking dumbass. Are you kidding me? Um, please. Um, So anyway, you know, the whole fucking world's fucked. I guess in, in conclusion, uh, Microsoft shut these studios down. I, I don't know what to make of it in terms of like, you know, Microsoft is still a fairly, uh, fairly, you know, how many billions of dollars in profit did they make? Um, it is 21.9 billion in profits. Beating Wall Street's expectations. Um, now, obviously, you don't stay a profitable company by ma making sure that your unprofitable portions of your company stay around and stay in business. They're not running a charity. I understand that. Like, business is harsh. It sucks. It's fucking trash. Um, but also, like, I, I just, I, I can't help but look at this as, like, as two, as two things. Again, we don't have the whole story. It may be the case that developers left these studios at a, at a point, you know, like where the pitches didn't seem like they were doable, viable products anymore. And, and maybe Microsoft is kind of like, Hey, you know, like we, the, the lift it would take to get to Dishonored three at this point, we would have to go out and hire a bunch of people. It would take a really long time. We're out of time. We can't have another four or five year thing. We can't, you know, we, we, we cannot let this wait long enough. We're just, we're going to, we're going to cut our losses here, shut this studio down and invest this money somewhere else. Like that's a, a shit situation. But if, if that ends up being the situation, I think that that at least makes some kind of sense. If they're looking at tango and going like, well, Mikami left. So we don't really have the big name there anymore. Um, what, what's, what's tango going to do next? We loved hi-fi rush. Is there another one of those and how much will it cost to make, and how much will it cost? You know, how much profit will it make? How many student, how many people are we employing there? Um, okay. Is it evil within three? Is it Ghostwire Tokyo two? Is it this or that? Or, you know, like, like ultimately, ultimately there's, there are enough things about that situation that we don't know that. Yeah. Again, maybe there was a, something of an exodus at Tango game works when, after Mikami left and, and, and maybe the, Studio leadership there is not what it used to be. And so if you're Microsoft, you have to look at that and be like, do we think that this team can make it happen with this, with, with these people in place? If they hire these people, you know, like, like whatever they, they end up doing. I'm not saying that was the situation. I'm saying that that is a, that is a situation that you would look at and go like, well, maybe we don't invest in this studio Again, maybe we don't, maybe we don't place this bet right now because we don't think that, that it will do what it needs to do or it will come in on time or under budget or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but also I think the idea of shutting down the studio, I, I think, I think the idea of shutting down Arcane Austin, uh, the studio that made Prey, um, which is a very renowned video game redfall is not a good game you know i'm not this isn't i'm not i can't i can't sit here and defend redfall i know they did put some work into it but like at some point 
with that thing, no amount of work was going to actually fix the stuff that needed to be fixed there. You know, getting it to run at 60 frames per second on, on an Xbox was not going to suddenly make everyone love Redfall. Um... And also, it seemed like it was taking a very long time. Uh, not that, you know, like, you know, and that the DLC was then delayed. And, and, and all of that stuff adds up to a point where it's like, God, are we going to, what's the right thing to do with Redfall? Like, initially, the right thing to do with Redfall was to make sure that you are fixing the game. And so to make sure that you, you know, it, it, you can kind of end it on a positive note. You can't just cut and run and be like, all right, here's their next game. So instead they put some work in on it and then cut and run later, but also shut the studio down. So there is no next game. So you're like from the makers of Redfall. Um, that feels fucking bad. It feels very bad. And again, I, I don't know what it says about, you know, developing games at, at, at Microsoft. Um, I, I think that 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 becomes another factor there. Like, you know, if you're, you know, are you, are you going to finish up your project? Like is Indiana Jones going to ship and they're going to be like, all right, machine games, you know, what do you want to do? And they're going to go Wolfenstein three. We owe people Wolfenstein three. And then is Microsoft going to go like, eh, we're not feeling it. So we th instead think that you should, uh, pack up your stuff. You know, like I, um, And that stuff sucks. Uh, yeah, and, and someone in chat says, you know, curious to see what Harvey Smith does next. Harvey Smith has been... Gosh, I mean, he's been doing this in some way, shape, or form for like 30 years or something now, right? I mean, what was it? He was like QA on System Shock and then had that dinosaur thing that got canceled and... uh, Was it Midway for a minute? I think the only time I ever talked to Harvey Smith, I think the only time I ever spoke with Harvey Smith was in, in league with the black site area 51 game that he found himself working on at midway, uh, there for, for a little bit. And, um, that was not a great game. Uh, But yeah, uh, I mean, he's, he's obviously, uh, had he's, his, his name has also been on a lot of, of big games over the years too. Curious to see, um, what ends up happening, uh, what, what he ends up doing next for sure. Uh, <sighs> So yeah, I don't know. Like I, I already there was already stuff with this week's news that was was a little all over the place, and I was already kind of like bummed out about aspects of it. But then that all that Microsoft stuff just happened this morning, and um, yeah, it uh, it it feels very it it feels bad. It feels bad. Uh, my hearts go out to uh, all, all the people affected by this. You know this. The, it's, it's another, it's another big one. It's, it's another, like in, in the wake of a, a ton of other layoffs and like, how do you, you know, where do you go? What do you do? What's the Austin scene even like anymore for game development? Um, cause they were, they were a fairly, probably a, a fairly major part of that. Um, <sighs> Turns out the people over at PlayStation don't know how to make PC games. They have no idea what goes into selling a PC game. They have no idea uh, how to make all of that work. And they did not think anything through when they decided to publish Helldivers 2 on the PC. Uh, this last week has been a really fascinating a display of that lack of knowledge, that lack of know-how. Certainly, Sony has published multiple 
PC games. Uh, but with Helldivers 2 being a an online game, uh, this was perhaps I, the first time that... Is this the very first time they've done any sort of cross-play with console on a Sony-published PC game? Anyway. Helldivers 2. People love it. People very excited about Helldivers 2. And then they went ahead and announced uh, a little while ago. God, is this, did this all take place over the course of a week? Or was it like a week and change? Anyway, uh, it was announced that Helldivers 2 was going to, at some point, uh, I believe May 3rd, yes. So it was an update that was going to hit yesterday, originally. And uh, when that update hit on the 6th, it was going to create a situation where all new players would have to link a PlayStation Network account in order to play the game. And all existing players would have to link their account by May 30th. So basically every player would need to have a PSN account. Um, there's just one problem with that. There's, okay, there's one major problem with that, let's say. When Helldivers 2 launched on Steam, they decided to sell the game in a ton of territories where PSN does not exist, where you cannot legally make a PSN account. So you could obviously just jump through some hoops and go make a PSN account in some other territory or something if they decided to follow through with that. Um, but an incredible lack of foresight on Sony's part, I have to say. The very notion that they would try to force this update and not realize that they had already sold, let's just call it tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, who knows? Some number with a bunch of zeros after it because the game has been selling quite well. So you have to imagine it's been selling quite well in some of these territories uh, that they sold a whole lot of copies of the game in places where that was impossible for a player to legally do impossible for a player to legally create a PSN account <laughs> and just never thought anything of this. And so at some point on the back end of steam, they updated it to say, Oh, we need to stop selling it in those territories. <laughs> and that's not the solution. Players were uh, fucking pissed off. And at, at first I was like, well, you know, so many games have dog shit third party account logins and all this other stuff. At least PSN has been around for a while and probably isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon compared to like your, you know, Bethesda.net login or whatever the hell. Um, But to do this when you've been selling the game in a territory where you cannot actually do PSN, make a PSN account is fuck ridiculous. Are you fucking kidding me? Like that was the wrinkle that when I heard this, <laughs> it's like I could not stop laughing for a little bit. I was like, are you fucking serious? Jesus Christ? Um, this was something they said was going to be done for security reasons and, and, and all of that. And I, I, you know, that, that strikes me as a little, you know, hey, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know that I buy that per se. But um, plenty of games have done crossplay without, um, without linking to PSN or, uh, or Xbox Live or any of the kind of major console services or whatever. But yeah, it just sounds like this was a lot of this was sort of, um. Yeah, that the developer was going to get access to the PSN moderation tools and that as those tools are already built and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and so uh, this was met with a lot of negativity on behalf of the Helldivers 2 fan base who said, that's uh, complete bullshit. You're basically locking me out of the game. Presumably Valve would have to give refunds on the game uh, even if players had played more than two hours of it, because you know you you wouldn't be able to play it in that region 
anymore. Um, and the head of the developer, the head of, uh, of Arrow, Arrowhead, 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 um, at some point, just on his like personal Twitter account was like, not, I'm not saying he was throwing his publisher under the bus per se, but it was a lot of like, yeah, I just want to make a good game. I don't, is it, we're just, we're just trying to make a, we're just trying to make a good game. Uh, yeah, no, we're, we hear you. Uh, we're bringing all your feedback to Sony, uh, but it's ultimately their call. Like just kind of saying like, yeah, they, that's on them. They're that's, they're sort of, they're sort of calling the shots on this. We just want to make, we just want to make fun. We just want to have bugs and, uh, you shoot the bugs and, uh, we just want you to buy our battle pass. We just want, please just, oh my God, just please just, uh, please don't. Um, and so he pointed people in the direction of Sony every chance he got, which uh, while I'm sure 100% true in this situation, <laughs> I have to imagine on the Sony side, they're like, yeah, there ain't going to be no fucking hell divers three. Yeah. We're never, yo, 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 yeah. We're going to work with these guys again. Yeah. Thanks buddy. Thanks for your help. I'm sure they're really stoked about it. Um, but also, uh, Sony did eventually reverse course on this. And so the, the update here is, Helldivers fans, we've heard your feedback on the Helldivers 2 account linking update. The May 6th update, which would have required Steam and PlayStation Network account linking for new players and for current players beginning May 30th, will not be moving forward. We'll st we're still learning what is best for PC players, and your feedback has been invaluable. Thanks again for your continued support of Helldivers 2, and we'll keep you updated on future plans. And, and like, honestly, that's probably true um or look i'm sure that there are people inside of sony who were like wait you want to do what you realize we've been selling the game like you you can't you realize we can't do that and then like someone higher up the chain like as you get higher up the chain and get even more disconnected from fucking like actually playing a video game and what's that like i'm sure there's someone and especially you know hey jim ryan's out so there's like a weird leadership vacuum at the top where the other guy has stepped in on an interim basis on some level, you probably just get to someone who's just like, I don't give a shit, man. We want those fucking numbers. We want those account details. If we're not building PSN account lists off of this so that we can market to them later, um, so that we can have more accounts in our system, so that we can control these people and make sure that we can ban them if we need to, if we don't get that out of this, if we don't get any customer data out of this, then we are wasting our fucking time. So I don't give a shit what you just told me. I don't even remember what you just said. Get those fucking email addresses. Um, and then the noise got loud enough that the person in that position eventually was like, oh, okay, yeah, all right. Well, figure it out. So, I mean, my take on this is that eventually this does go forward because they find some interim... They, they'll have to engineer something now. Like the, the, ultimately this probably leads to a situation where the developers have to engineer some kind of solution that acts as a shim between their account system and the PSN account system. And if it gives them access to the tools that they need access to in a different way or something like that, I, I wonder if this ends up being a situation where, uh, you know, updates to the game are slowed a little bit because now suddenly they have to, you know, something that would have been like probably a lot easier to roll out technology wise, even if it is a thousand percent wrong for them to do, um, is now something that they have to build bespoke, uh, for their game. Um, anyway, it, it's good that that changed because that's stupid. Um, like, especially like if, if they had restricted the sale of the game to territories that only had PSN accounts, I think that you would have had two things. One, you would not have had this be as big of a deal as it would have been, but two, you probably would not have sold as many copies as you did. Um, videogameschronicle.com is citing a research firm called Circana, where, uh, Matt Piscatella is. 
Uh, and he had to say, PC has, has been a huge part of the success of Helldivers 2 in the US, with PC, Helldivers 2 is already the seventh highest grossing Sony published game in history. Without PC, it wouldn't currently rank among the top 20. So just from a straight up dollars perspective, like Sony has a very vested interest in making sure that this game continues to sell the way it does and, and that it, you know, it has been a, a widespread success. It has been a phenomenal breakout hit. I mean, I think a lot of people were looking forward to Helldivers 2, but not like this, you know? Um, like, it's definitely become a, a phenomenon. And uh, very funny that Sony would try to, like, do their damnedest to shoot themselves in the foot about it for uh, over, over account details or, or whatever else. Along the way... On all of this stuff. Uh, Sucker Punch. The developers of Ghost of Tsushima. Got out there on Twitter and said. Hey. Just so you're aware. A PSN account is required. Uh, for Ghost of Tsushima Legends. Online multiplayer mode. And to use the PlayStation overlay. It is not required. To play the single player game. So that, remember that. In, a, in, a, in nine days here they are going to release Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut on the PC. And it, it appears that their entire multiplayer solution is built around PSN. Sony's been out there touting this and how it's going to have an overlay and be able to, you know, you'll be able to get trophies for the first time on a PC uh, and, uh, and all of that stuff. So uh, that's not a huge surprise, but it was just funny in, in the context of all of this other stuff going on that they were like, uh, so hey... Listen, yeah, you're going to need one of those if you want to play multiplayer. So, yeah. Um, at least people know before they walk in and before they, you know, go and make a purchase. I ran into, th this is not quite the same thing, but so I have had uh, Top Spin 2K5 installed, a 2K's tennis game. Uh, installed since it launched and uh, I launched it the other day to finally give it a look and it goes through all the process of like hey man do you want subtitles do you want to use the metric system or the other thing imperial or whatever we're calling it uh, hey what how big is your screen do you want to uh, change the the safe zones like you go through the first several setup steps and then it pops up a screen that says update your 2k account your account is missing details or is unverified. Complete your account to start playing now. And then it gives me a QR code or like a URL along with like a six digit character, like, like number that I can enter into their website so that I can log into the account. Like, I, you know, I've had a 2K account for years. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know what, when I created it, but you know, some 2K game years ago. And that stuff just gets linked to your Steam account and you never think about it. But, like, there's no button on this that says, like, no. There's no button on this that says, like, leave me alone and let me play the video game. All I can do is go link that account or hit Alt F4. And so I have been hitting Alt F4 um, on that. <laughs> um like I, it's the very idea that there's no, you know, that something changed on their account stuff so much, uh, that like, no, like we're not even going to show you this in game and let you agree to it. You have to go to our website and then manually go, you know, fill in more data. I don't like it says missing details or is unverified, which it is not unverified because it's existed for years. So I'm sure at some point, at some point I had to verify that email address or, or whatever else. Missing details sounds like, oh, well, do you need more data from me? Like, what, you, you're not collecting enough? Stupid. The idea that that pops up and that, that, like, it's just like at some point lawyers have to make a pass on the game and they go, yeah. Um, you, we need to get them to agree to a new terms of service and no, you cannot legally allow them to play that game until they do so. And you're like, what? 
on some level that stuff is probably good because it's data protections and it's you know it's they have to they're that they're forced to ask instead of just taking it or or whatever it's probably not the worst thing in the world but you know just in terms of like checkpoints and little stops and, and little little bumps in the road that get between you and just playing a goddamn video game um that stuff's just fucking wild especially because especially because i just played wwe 2k24 another 2k so it must be a very recent change in their account system shit because the wwe game just let me load it up and play it whereas now with top spin out they're like mm gonna let you even see what this tennis game looks like until you scan this qr code i'm like ah good good um another little thing this is something from the playstation blog that i thought was really great uh back on may 1st they confirmed that they are rolling out a new way to invite players into playstation 5 multiplayer sessions and it is a shareable link as, as dumb as this, that might sound as like as, as painfully uh, normal as that might sound. I think that that's actually kind of awesome. It basically it's, it, you can generate a QR code that you can share with a friend to get them into your session. Um, or there will be kind of like shareable uh, links that you can share directly to discord and it will have a join button on Discord that will then, you know, because your, your PSN account is hooked up to Discord, it will know how to link you up to this other thing. Basically, it's them circumventing their own friends lists and other and their existing invite system in order to build something based on how people use the Internet now. And this is maybe a little clunky in some ways. But like, I cannot remember the last time I added someone to my PlayStation friends list. Like the, the, that, th those are not lists that I am keeping up anymore and be like, as I kind of encounter new people online that I am tight with that I go like, Oh, I got to get you on my Xbox list. Like, no, but I might want to play a game with them at some point. And, and instead of going like, well, what's your name on this? Okay, let me do this and then send you the invite. Did you see the invite? Like having something that can directly appear on Discord, having something that can directly appear as a shareable link that you can post wherever it is you're posting. All you fucking Microsoft Teams fiends out there. I know you're there. If you're on Ventrilo, some, you know, you're out there on a team speak. Um... And also you can use the PlayStation app on your phone to interact with all of that stuff as well. Um, and so they're trying to create kind of a new little ecosystem that uh, doesn't require you to go and become friends with them on PSN first. And, you know, I'm sure that this will lead to people becoming friends. Um, but I think that's just really smart. I think that's, that's one of those things that um, I, I don't know about you but it doesn't really seem like the the Xbox friends list, the PlayStation friends list, like those just don't feel like they matter in the way that they did 10, 15 years ago. Um, in terms of just like keeping those up and, and, and you know, keeping friends, like the, the Xbox ones, are it's, it's like a Twitter style following thing now even. So it's sort of, that's even weirder in some ways where you can follow someone and theoretically see what they're playing depending on their privacy settings and they don't even know that you're, they don't know who you are. Um, so it, it's just, you know, the, the there needs to be things like this. Uh, agnostic systems like this that are not tied to any individual social network per se, though, you know, they, they did they did build a, a good kind of widget for uh, for use in discord. Um, this stuff is smart. I just I, I saw that and was just wanted to say that's fucking cool that they're doing that. Uh, they should do this. And it's good that they're doing it. Nintendo is going to make a... Uh, they're going to make a video game machine. Uh, they're going to make the successor to the Nintendo Switch. I, that's all we know about it. I don't know. I'll, I'll read the tweet here from Nintendo... This is Furukawa, president of Nintendo. 
we will make an announcement about the successor to Nintendo Switch within this fiscal year. It will have been over nine years since we announced the existence of Nintendo Switch back in March 2015. We will be holding a Nintendo Direct this June regarding the Nintendo Switch software lineup for the latter half of 2024, but please be aware that there will be no mention of the Nintendo Switch successor during that presentation. This is Furukawa, president of... Um, Uh, so yeah, I don't know that, uh, if, if, if they're going to announce it sometime this fiscal year, that means before March of next year, I believe they will announce the system. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to ship it in that window. Um, it's really just an acknowledgement that uh, it's the first official acknowledgement, I think of there being a follow-up to the switch. Obviously, you know, seems like dev kits are kind of out there in some situations. But, uh, yeah, they will announce it sometime this fiscal year and they will not talk about it at their thing in June. That is the most like, uh, I mean, I guess we're about a month out from, from June. So I was going to say that's the longest lead they've given on a, Hey, we're doing a Nintendo direct. It's not going to talk about the thing you want us to talk about. This is Furukawa president of Nintendo. Also silk song will not be there. Um, please understand. In other Nintendo news, the ESRB has rated a product called Nintendo World Championships NES Edition. It's rated at E for everyone. <clears throat> this is an unannounced game, but there is a bit of a rating summary here. The paragraph is pretty straightforward and it just says, this is a collection of 2D challenges and platformer games in which players traverse through various modes, uh, for example, speed run and survival. Several challenges involve reaching specific points, while others prompt players to defeat small enemies or survive brief battles. Some games depict pixelated characters using small swords or arrows to strike at enemies. Enemies typically get stunned or disappear in a flash. Um, so the Nintendo world championships was a thing back in, was it 1990 or something? They made that custom NES cart that played, was it Mario duck hunt and rad racer? Um, and you would play each for a set amount of time. And at the end of it, it would, it would kind of, um, spit out a score. And so, you know, the, and then someone, I think they won a fancy jacket or whatever, but like the cartridges themselves became the, the big, um, the big icon, the big artifact out of that stuff. So this is named after the, the Nintendo world championships, but this description sounds to me a lot more like, um, NES remix. If you remember that, uh, kind of, kind of disappointing product, uh, NES remix. I wanted to be a lot more than it was in the vein of like, if it was a little more weird in a WarioWare like way. But this does sound like something similar in, in so far as they talk about various modes like speed run and survival. This sounds like that they will be chopping up various NES games um, <clears throat> and presenting them in a speed run mode or like a 20 second, like almost like a mini game. Um, a, a mini game like mode. Some challenges involve reaching specific points, which sounds to me like, Oh, we're going to put one Mario level in this thing and you want to get there as fast as possible. And I wonder, you know, so, so th this is presumably a product that will hit on the switch at some point this year, probably. Um, and I wonder if this is something that they're going to do. Um, any kind of, big actual tournament around if they're going to try to create a new Nintendo world championships, but with a game that they will happily sell you for 30 bucks or whatever. Um, and so that, that to me sounds pretty cool. Uh, but also I thought that NES remix sounded really cool. And I feel like that was a, 
like hugely disappointing um product at the end of the day and so hopefully this is hopefully this is more than that you know uh we'll have to wait and see on that one uh <sighs> This was the layoff story before the other layoff story became the layoff story. Take two uh, is looking to close Roll7 and Intercept Games. That's the studios behind... Uh, Roll7 is the studio behind Rollerdrome, as well as, like, uh, as well as Ollie Ollie, which is a fantastic, fun skateboarding game. The last one, Ollie Ollie World, was cool. Uh, Roller Drome was had a really amazing style and a really amazing idea. Um, it was clunky in a few ways, but it was also fucking stylistically rad. Um, Intercept Games is kind of the studio that came together. Um, or I, I think that the the name didn't exist until Take Two acquired it, but that's that's the Kerbal Space Program Two team, basically. Um. And that game's still in some form of early access. So I, I, I think that Take-Two has come out and said that there will still be... Yeah, so here's the, here's the statement. Videogameschronicle.com has the statement here. Um, let's see. They don't get specific on it, uh, but they say Take-Two announced a cost reduction plan. So this is something they initially announced back in mid-April that they were going to conduct layoffs. Um, but in, yeah, Intercept Games is the crew they brought together, I think, to make, to do Kerbal Space Project 2, I guess. Um, on April 18th, Private Division successfully launched Moon Studios No Rest for the Wicked. The label continues to make updates to Kerbal Space Program 2 and plans to release Weta Workshop Game Studios, Tales of the Shire, a Lord of the Ring, a, a, a The Lord of the Rings game. That's the clunkiest name I've ever seen. Tales of the Shire, colon, a the Lord of the Rings game. In the second half of 2024. Uh, I think that, that like, look, uh, the, the world has changed. The economy has changed. All of that, right? You can use that to try to justify layoffs if you like i think the practice of acquiring studios who then go on to do pretty much exactly what you bought them to do and then shutting them down i i mean i guess the lesson here is don't fucking sell your studio unless you're unless you're done and maybe the, maybe some of these folks were when they sold their studio like don't sell your small business to a big public company unless you're ready to walk away from it You know, it's not yours anymore on the other end of it. They can shut it down the next day. Um, but like, th this just feels egregiously bad of just like, oh, okay. These teams that, you know, like Kerbal, Kerbal Space Project was like, the, was like this amazing, massive, beloved thing. The sequel, maybe not so much. Seems like the sequel has had uh, some issues getting updates out in a timely fashion or, or, or what have you. I, I have not been following it that closely, but it doesn't seem like people are extremely thrilled about the state of that game. And I don't think that, you know, I have to imagine that if they are really laying off the team that was charged with making those updates, uh, that doesn't. Well, that doesn't sound great. Um... And the team, you know, like Roll7, Roll7 made no bad games. Roll7, I'll, I'll let me go look and, and, and make sure that that is a true statement. But I think everything Roll7 made was good. Let's look. They made Roller Drome. That's a good game. They made Ollie Ollie World, which was cool. Maybe a little more Ollie Ollie than I needed because I loved Ollie Ollie 1 and 2 so much. But Ali Ali World is still real good. They made a game called Run Me that I don't know a damn thing about. They made Laser League, which was kind of a cool indie multiplayer thing back when people were trying to make indie multiplayer games. 
it did about as well as most of the indie multiplayer games did. Uh, but it was good. It was well made. Not a Hero, which is a cool game. Gets to the Exit, which is pre Oli Oli. Let's just pre- nod and pretend we remember the games that happened pre Oli Oli. There you go. Roll 7 made a lot of good games. I, like, I don't know what you're expecting to get out of Roll 7 when you buy Roll 7 other than Roll 7 continued to do what Roll 7 did. They made good games, many of them involving skating of some kind. But, I, you know, what's, but, but you're still like, that's just, why buy it? Why buy it at that point? God damn it. Fuck. <sighs> X Defiant is going to come out, apparently. If this is to be believed, uh, X Defiant is finally going to release on May 21st. We were talking about this not that long ago in terms of like, it felt like they had kind of gone dark on that game. They ran a server test a week or two ago. I played one or two matches of that and felt exactly the same way I have felt about it. The last couple of times they have put out tests um, where I played it and was like, yeah, okay, this is, this is decent. I don't think it steals any meaningful amount of players from other competitive shooters out there. It's, it's free to play and it has a competitive shooter mode. Whereas call of duty charges for that mode. Maybe that's a thing. I don't think it is. Um, but yes, they will be, they will be launching on PC and console on May 21st. According to this, um, Oh, the dead sec faction. If you remember correctly, this is the competitive shooter where all of the characters uh, are part of factions that exist in other Ubisoft games. And so you have a Far Cry 6 faction. You have Libertad in there. You have Echelon. So you have your kind of splinter cell faction. You have dead sec, which is the watchdogs faction. Uh, Dead Sec will not be playable for free at launch. You will have to unlock or purchase it. I imagine that is through some sort of battle pass style situation, or maybe you can just purchase it if you want it all the way. The factions do have um, unique ults and abilities. So they're locking like gameplay differences behind um, behind paywalls and unlocks and stuff, which is a choice. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 14 maps, five modes, domination, hot shot, occupy, escort, and zone control. Um, Hmm. So one of my, one of my problems with, uh, X defiant was something that I thought it was just because it was a test and because they were doing tests. But one of my problems with it was all of these modes are objective modes. And I don't think that their objective modes are especially great. Um, I don't think they feel especially fun to play even you know, they're, they're standard style of modes. But there was no team deathmatch option anywhere in there. And I figured that that was because they really wanted to test their objective modes and make sure that they were good. Uh, because if they had team deathmatch inside of their test, then everyone would just play that. Um, but now here I am looking at their list. Domination, hotshot, occupy, escort, and zone control. And none of those are team deathmatch. I think that's a pretty big tactical error on their part. I think that they think their game is going to be more serious than it is and that they are trying to make sure that it appeals to a more serious 
fan base, but also it's a free to play game. So they're going to potentially attract a very casual shooter audience and then dump that casual audience into domination matches and hot shot, which I, if I remember right, is some kind of like one player on a team on a team is the hot shot and you get extra points for killing them because they're the, the team, the score. I think the score leader on each team is deemed to be some kind of special target. I think that's what hot shot is. So sort of a VIP mode escort sure sounds like another V. Oh no. Escort is like a escort is like a payload thing. They had that in one of the betas. I remember trying that now. That's like a overwatch style, like stand near this thing. So it rolls forward type of deal. I think that's a real buzzkill. I, I have to say that there was part of me that was like, well, when next fight comes out, I'll mess with it and maybe I'll have an okay time with it. But like, I don't want to play those modes. That's the thing that kept me from playing their tests very long because I was like, I didn't, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really want to mess with these modes, but Hey, when the full, when the full thing rolls out, surely they'll have team death met. Apparently not. That's a choice. That's a choice. Um, Last little bit of news here uh, from Gamatsu.com. I I just, I'm fascinated by this. Rem remember Let It Die. Remember the game Let It Die. Cool game, cool style. Uncle Death, so on and so forth. Mushrooms and stickers and all that weird shit. Um, remember they made a sequel to it called Deathverse Let It Die? And it was not good. And it didn't have any of the cool shit uh, in it that Let It Die had. And then they they took that offline. <laughs> the studio that made, uh, I guess, that worked on both of these games, Super Trick Games, is now working on... They, when, they, when they took Deathverse down, they, it was one of those situations where they're like, hey, we'll be back. We're going to take this down and fix it because no one is playing it. And, um, and it was like, what I'm trying to even remember. I played a few rounds of it. It was like kind of a small scale battle Royale thing with different zones. And so it was kind of this melee focused PVP combat thing. And I played like two matches of it in one and then I uninstalled it. Uh, so they are, they are now working on whatever that game is, but I, but I guess like the, the bit here. So I guess that, you know, it's, it's a translated developer diary. Um, and so they are in the process of remaking death verse completely. Um, and it sounds like they are going to try to skew much further in the direction of the original Let It Die here. Uh, I'm looking at quotes here. There's a this quotes here from uh, Hideyuki Shin, who's the director of the game, says, So in the past, we released Let It Die and Deathverse. This time, we're aiming to make a game that will please both fans of Let It Die and Deathverse. Oh, I don't know. I don't know that you only had two fans. I think there were more than two fans of Let It Die and zero fans of Deathverse. So, I, you know, both fans is kind of weird. Um, to be specific with Deathverse, we created a game centered around player versus player, but there were a lot of things we felt could be improved. After considering those, we decided to make a game that, like Let It Die, has a clear gameplay loop you repeat many times, but also lets you fight against other players. We're trying to take the fun parts from both games to make something new. In short, it will be a roguelike exploration game featuring both co-op and player versus player. Uh, it'll be taking the good parts from Let It Die. Actually, more accurately, it'll be using Let It Die as a base to build on. Um, so yeah, I I I I'm fascinated by this because again, I I thought that uh, I thought that Let It Die was a cool game. Deathverse was never felt like a sequel to Let It Die. It never felt like it had anything meaningful in common, especially stylistically with the first Let It Die and zero people were playing it, so it was impossible to find a, a match. Um, but 
they are following through. They they did say when they were taking it down, they're like, hey, we're going to, we got work to do. And so it looks like they are doing that work. They shared a screenshot of it in this death, in this dev diary. And, um, well, I don't know. But I, I, that's, that's a game I will look out for. That's like, I will, I will definitely look at that thing and see what the heck it is, especially, you know, they're going to add co-op to it. That's kind of a weird, um, thing. Not that weird for death verse, but weird for let it die. I guess I would say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, that's it for the news. Fucking brutal, man. I, 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 the everything feels off and I'm trying to, you know, it, it's hard. Um, one of the hard things about, um, kind of like working out of your house. And one of the hard things about like the, the way everything is now, you know, with much fewer events and, and fewer opportunities for everyone to get together in a single location and go like, Hey, how's it going? Um, it, it's some, it's, it's a little bit harder to get a read on that as it used to be. Um, so it's been like a several days of like me having online chat messages with people and going like, Hey, how's it, is this, it's fucking weird. It's, it's not just me, right? It's fucking weird out there. Right. And like, Oh yeah, it's, it's fucking weird. It's real. It's real weird. Um, I just, yeah, I, I, I wonder what Summer Games Fest is going to be and what it's going to have, if it's going to uh, restore the feeling, if it's going to, you know, like have a, a, a good number of announcements like this Xbox thing now, right? I mean, last week people were talking about the Xbox showcase and it's going to have more games, it's going to have this and that. And you're like, okay, well, what... You know, Microsoft has to ship all the games they already have announced. Like, what you know, what do we, what the fuck is happening? Um, it's hard to feel optimistic about um the well. I, it, it's it's been this way. It's been this way, I guess. But like, it, as these things continue to spiral apart, and 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 you know, these these layoffs of small teams at two K and. Uh, and the, the Microsoft stuff, like it is, it is harder to feel good about the machine. It's hard to feel good about the traditional publisher system, the, the kind of standard publisher developer relationship, the, the, the old game industry, um, it, like that stuff feels like it's just falling apart, you know? between all these layoffs and, and everything else that's happening, like, like this, and, and some of that was maybe destined to happen, you know, like the, a lot of teams don't need to have publishers in, in those roles anymore. They can publish it themselves. There are much smaller publishers out there that will deal with much smaller games. And there's a lot of like exciting things happening underneath that machine, I guess I would say, right. You know, the, the indie developers and, and, you know, like El Paso elsewhere is getting a film deal. That's the sort of thing that would be reserved for some big triple a quadruple a fucking massive franchise thing here. But now we live in an environment or, or we, you know, we operate in this environment where like these smaller IPs can still kind of make those sorts of waves. And, um, and so I, I don't mean this to say that there's no excitement in video games because I think there's actually a ton of fuck. You know, Hades 2 just came out. It's fucking awesome. It feels great to play. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, I, I'm, I'm still working my way through mini shoot adventures, which is uh, some of the most fun I've had playing a game in, in, you know, the last year or so. Dragon's Dogma 2 came out this year. It's, it's crazy. It feels like that. It feels like discussion of that game was not as loud and as long as I maybe thought it would be. I, it feels like that game kind of came and went um, in, a, in a weird way. I still need to play more Dragon's Dogma 2. Um, I figure I'll have time later this year. Because it doesn't seem like anything else is coming out. Um, 
and uh yeah look i you know i i don't want to be doom and gloom i think is is my point here because i think there are there are a lot of you know hey dive kick got patched on pc the assets are not as aliased as they used to be and that's a big win for everybody there are a lot of great things happening in video games um but it's happening down here you know the 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 companies that are up here, the public companies and the, the, the big traditional publishers, like they just feel like they're floundering. They feel like they, it, it feels like a fucking mess. They feel like they're getting eaten alive. And that's not the case per se, but it sure as shit feels that way sometimes with the rapid pace of these layoffs and all this other kind of stacked up bad news and uh, account systems and data acquisition and this and that, you know, like all the... All that capitalism, all them live service games, uh, just feel like it's all crashing down sometimes and, and it doesn't feel good. So like, you know, like I'm in the middle of like booking appointments with like some of those major publishers and, and not knowing what they're going to be showing in some cases and just being like, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I'm like, normally that would be a time for me to really get my hopes up about like, oh, I wonder if they're going to have this and this. And then now I'm just like. I don't know. They'll probably announce two things and cancel one of those things in two years. And who knows? I mean, I don't know. Like skate four isn't even out yet. And this, then what's that even going to be? So what, what else is, you know, like Warner brothers shuts down movies left and right. Like what's to stop them from doing that with games now? Like what, you know, there's so many different, it's just a lot of stuff. I don't know. Like what's going on with, big publishers and, and all that stuff. It doesn't it does not feel good. It does not feel good. But um but yeah, I I don't know. I, I, I don't I don't mean to say that like that that that's not how I feel about all of video games. I just think that like the the energy, the the positivity, the good shit happening in video games is happening in much smaller projects and much smaller products. And that's awesome. Uh, but sometimes I need the big, expensive, weird thing. You know, as someone who was raised on games like that, it makes me sad that games like that feel like they're just not. Like they're, you know, they're, they're getting fucked up one way or the other. They're, you know, they're like the, the big games have gotten too big and and whatever else that said you know like i i still really i want to see uh the this this big last destiny expansion um i want to know for sure that the final shape is indeed a trapezoid if it's not i'm uninstalling the game again i want the fi i want it to be the sweetest trapezoid i've ever seen in a video game um, do you think that the, uh, extraction shooter thing that it was teased as like suddenly being a thing? Cause it felt like a lot of those were getting announced. Do you think that that will ever materialize? You know, we haven't heard about marathon in a long time. They've had layoffs since then. Um, like I'm trying to think what the other extraction shooters that got kind of announced but it feels like a lot of that is fizzled. It feels like the the excitement about that specific sub genre um, has has absolutely fizzled out. As people thought that that was going to be the next big thing, and then whether it's like I don't know, everyone's fucking probably still pissed at Tarkov. Um, that rainbow, yeah, yeah. I don't know, just like that I, it feels like that there was discussion about extraction shooter type stuff for six months as like, this is going to be the ne next big thing. And then like everyone just kind of shut the, and, and maybe they just shut the fuck up and got back to work and all this stuff will still come out. But like, uh, it felt like we announced a lot of those in, in a uh, tight succession. And I don't know, or if the players actually want that thing, want that genre to happen or not. We'll see. I don't know. I, I just, just thought of that because I just like, it, it, it felt like that was, it felt like the term extraction shooter was suddenly everywhere. 
in terms of new projects getting announced. I mean, Marathon was like probably the highest profile of those. But yeah, what is it like Dead Drop and some of that other stuff? Um, and of course, Tarkov feels like it never really broke through. There's probably some mainstream version of Tarkov that humans might actually play. But maybe that's Marathon or maybe that's whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but then, but then everyone who likes Tarkov just kind of got fucked over by the makers of Tarkov. So, uh, maybe that will, <laughs> maybe that will put a bullet in that thing once and for all. I don't know. Um, let's get into some emails. Podcast at guard.bike is the email address. You can send me, uh, some emails. Much like it's loading, it's loading, it's loading. Much like Ozzy from Atlanta did. Says, looking at today's news about Microsoft shutting down Tango and Arcane, it's made me reflect on the last 15 years of their business. A lot of people would say it started going wrong with the Xbox One and the Kinect, but I can't help but think that they really started to go off track when Bungie went independent. I forgot the specifics, but it's just crazy to me that they let that happen. I'm imagining an alternate reality where Microsoft kept Bungie and let them develop Destiny as an Xbox exclusive and how much differently that might have made the generation play out. Even though the first game was rough, there's no doubt that it, that 2 became a defining franchise of the generation. Any thoughts about how impactful that business decision really was or not in retrospect, especially considering now that Bungie has ended up a Sony owned developer. Um, I don't think it would have made a huge difference. Uh, it, okay. In, in this scenario that Ozzy is pitching, he's saying we're going to keep that, that Microsoft keeps Bungie, but also allows Bungie to stop making Halo. And so Bungie goes on to make Destiny and they just make it as an Xbox exclusive. Um, so you still have the formation of 343. Maybe it's just called Bungie Team One or something. You know, they don't spin up a different building for it because initially a lot of 343 people were Bungie people who decided, hey, we, we want to keep making Halo games. So we'll come over here and do it. Um, and so they stayed with Microsoft ultimately. Um, I think if Destiny had been an Xbox One exclusive, it would not have done nearly as well as it did. And so I think ultimately, if you had Destiny locked up on Xbox and you had Bungie making Destiny only for Xbox, I think it would have come and gone by now. I don't think it would have had the impact that it needed to. And I think that it would have been something that, uh, you know, maybe you would not have gotten Destiny to. At that point, maybe they would have tried Destiny and it wouldn't wouldn't necessarily have taken off because the Xbox One was such a mess of a console and you know, PC players would have messed with it a little bit, but it never would have fully gotten the support that it needed and, and it never would have taken off to the point where they got to Destiny 2. And um yeah, I, I think that that would have not gone nearly as well. I think that the Bungie needed to be out from under Microsoft. That game needed to be a multi-platform game at the time because the you know the PlayStation 4 had become something of a dominant console and and uh, in my mind the the console that you play Destiny on was always a PlayStation for as much as Halo is an Xbox game for whatever reason until it you know until Destiny 2 came out on PC and all that other stuff and um and now I just play it on PC with a PlayStation controller uh I in, in my mind, because of when it shipped, because of what the dominant console was at the time, Destiny just always reads as a PlayStation 4 game to me. Um, you know, and, and part of that is because of the way they marketed it and the way they, the way they positioned it and, and all of that. But like, that's, that's just how that always felt. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah. I, th I think if it had only come out on Xbox, then it would have, been trapped on a console that no one wanted to buy uh and and the xbox one would not have changed microsoft's fortunes on the xbox one um but it probably would have hurt the growth and the health of destiny <clears throat> Uh, 
Carl from Virginia writes in. Because last week you talked about Starfield updates, and maybe I'm reading into it, but you seemed baffled that they were still making a promised and sold DLC, patches, and bug fixes. I've seen people on Twitter and gaming publications echo similar feelings by implying Bethesda should just abandon the project and move on. However, a few weeks ago, you couldn't believe that the Fallout 4 next-gen update was fixing years-old quest bugs. So which is it? Should Bethesda, uh, should Bethesda abandon a project just because it had a middling reception? Or should they continue to work to improve the game for the people that bought it? And he kind of goes on for there. I think you have misrepresented or, or misunderstood what I'm getting at here. Um, of course they should make the DLC. Of course they should, should make that. Uh, I think that the problem with what is happening with Starfield right now is that when you go and look at the things that they are patching into Starfield and these updates that they're talking about, like, We've got this update that's going to hit on this Steam beta branch. And then once we've tested it there for a while, we're going to roll it out for everybody. And we're going to do this. And it's stuff like maps in cities. It's stuff like, like core gameplay functionality that should have been in the game at launch. It's stuff that anyone who played that game and dropped it already will never see. It's quality of life stuff that should have been in the game from day one. It's a lot of stuff that that game was noticeably missing at launch. And they're like, oh yeah, maps. We should do that. Um, and so my incredulity here is that the idea that they're out there talking up this, this next update's going to be awesome. A lot of feedback we've been getting, like, you are one of the biggest and most renowned studios in the world for this type of game. You have made multiple games like this. You have the backing of a console manufacturer, which I would assume, other recent news notwithstanding, uh, would result in you having the resources to make that game. The idea that Starfield shipped in the state that it was in, which is oh, kind of a weird thing to say because it's still shipped less broken than a lot of Bethesda's other games. But in terms of what that game is fundamentally, in terms of how you move around the world, how you fly around space, or rather don't fly around space, how you navigate the world when you're on a planet or in a town without a map. Um, I'm sure these are things that they probably, there were. I'm sure there were plenty of people inside that dev team that knew that that game needed that stuff, but that they did not have time to put that stuff in and make their ship date, which, you know, is, is kind of a separate issue. So in some respects, good on them for getting that game out the door without it being massively broken the way Fallout 4 was in some spots. But also, this is stuff that is coming to the game now how many months later? That nine months later? 10, you know, by the time it's actually shipped and live on all platforms, is that we're coming up on a year? And they're going to put maps in the game? I finished this game. When, when did I finish this game? I will open up the Xbox app and look at my achievements and see if I can tell you when I finished Starfield. Um, and so for me, and, and so uh, I will grant you that like not everyone has finished Starfield. If we, if we go look at achievements and we go look at, uh, you know, how many people finish games and, and all of that sort of stuff. I'm sure uh, the less than 50% of players have finished Starfield. Oh, good. I launched the Xbox app and now it's updating the Ubisoft Connect service. Great. Bad. Bad app. Bad app. Um, let's see here. View profile. This is taking forever to load. All right, Sonic the Fighters. I got all the achievements in that. That's pretty cool. Uh, there we go, Starfield. I have 350 points in Starfield. 
I believe the achievement is called One Giant Leap. Either way, the last time I earned an achievement in Starfield was September 20th. And so I finished this game in late September. It is now May. I will never, barring the DLC, bar, if, if the DLC brings me back in, which in traditionally, uh, traditionally these games, I do not return for the DLC. It is, that has been something of a rarity for me when it comes to Bethesda's games. But barring that, I will never, ever see any of the quality of life updates that they are adding to this game. Because I finished it already, because it's a single player game. And you play it, and you finish it, and you move on. Unless it's got a really healthy mod scene, and you're like, oh, I'm going to go back in and do this because the modders have added this. But modders seem fairly cool on Starfield, especially compared to how they have attacked some of other Beth of Bethesda's games uh, with fun mods and cool shit. Starfield, it does, even though those tools are not out yet, it does not feel that there is a healthy number of players or a healthy number of modders out there that are excited to get their hands on the Starfield tools. So they can spend all this time adding core things that I look at and go like, oh man, my playthrough would have been better if they had had this stuff because it's core functionality that the game should have had at launch. Um, so it's good that they're adding it because, you know, there, there will all, every day someone, I'm sure, I'm sure if you look at the numbers every single day, at least one person starts a new game of Starfield. We're still in that window where I'm sure that, that there's at least one person a day that launches that game for the first time. And so as they continue to fix it and add things to it, those players will get a better experience. Meanwhile, myself. And the other types of players who like to play games when they first come out will never see that stuff. And so the idea that they're out here excited about the patches they're working on at times comes across a slap. It's not, I was going to say a slap in the face. That's too harsh. Um, they're not fixing anything that I will ever see because I've finished the game. And I do not intend to go back and play it again because at the end of the day, I did not enjoy it enough to warrant that. And so that's why I'm like frustrated because a lot of this is stuff that should have been in the game at the outset. It's too late. They can go add all that stuff and yeah, players will come back to it when the DLC comes out and hopefully they will find uh, a game that has been revitalized through meaningful changes uh, big and small through that stuff and good for them. Uh, but like f for me, it's, it's like that ship sailed. I rolled credits on it. And at the time I rolled credits on it and was like, Phew. man, that ending was really terrible. Like it left a bad taste. I didn't, I didn't come away from going like, man, I can't wait to start a new character or uh, I'm going to, you know, the nature of that game is such that you could theoretically go and play it again. I started the new game plus stuff. And then as soon as it started, I was like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to do this. Like, and I closed the game and that was that. Um, that's cyberpunk was in a very similar boat with that, right? Where, you know, like objectively you could say cyberpunk is a much better game now than it was when it launched. But dumb me, I finished that game the week it came out. So fuck me. I got the bad cyberpunk. And the other thing is when every time I go back to cyberpunk, I go like, oh, actually there are a lot of things in this game that are still pretty fucking bad. Like they didn't go back and rewrite it. They didn't go back and re-record all of Keanu Reeves VO. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, there's still a lot about that game uh, that leaves uh, a, a lot to be desired, I think. But it's, it's the same type thing. Where like the the meaningful the, the the changes they made in Cyberpunk uh, that got me to relaunch it were graphical, you know. That when they added all the path tracing and, and everything, I was like, oh, I got to reinstall this and see what's up. And then I relaunched it, and I think I encountered a bug where it wouldn't let me. I couldn't jump anymore, and so I got stuck on the street and couldn't walk up the curb. It was cool. It was a real cool bug. Um. 
But yeah, Starfield, similar deal, right? I, I think that goes for a, a lot of story-driven games, a lot of story-driven single-player stuff. Like the idea that they're going to go patch this stuff months later that like you encountered when you played the game at launch and said like, man, I'm having a fucking bad time. This would be better if it had this. And then to have them go, yeah, we agree. And here it is. You're like, yeah, well, cool, man. I already fumbled my way around this town for hours, so I eventually kind of figured out where things are on my own, I guess. So, thanks for the maps, but I needed them six months ago. It's not useful anymore. Um, you know, every game's going to need patches, right? Nothing is going to ship 1,000% clean and and never need a a single patch right we're we're past the games are too complicated and and for for that to ever be a, a real reality um but uh yeah i don't know and you, and you could argue that like the right thing to do in those situations is to not play games at launch and wait for those fixes to hit but also, all these other games, well, maybe this is the the right year for that. Maybe this is the year that that pays off because a lot of stuff got delayed and, and whatever else. Like, maybe if you haven't played Starfield yet, you're like, yeah, I'm going to play it when it's good. I don't know. I don't know. It feels bad when those types of updates hit because I, I know I'm not, like, alone. I, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, the... I'm probably not in the majority on that, Um when it comes to shit, I forgot to do the one thing that we wanted to do here, which was look at the percentages on that. Uh, let me relaunch the Xbox app and see if it, see if it launches the Ubisoft client yet again. Um, but I want to see the percentages on that, uh, Starfield achievement. Let's see here. I have 2% of the achievements in Microsoft Sudoku. Here we go. Uh, nine point nine six percent of players have the one giant leap achievement in uh, in Starfield, which I believe is the one you get when you finish the game. Um, though, I mean. Uh, whatever if you, if you want to make yourself crazy achievement percentages is, is a really good way to do it. 43% of players reached level five in Starfield. And I, I bet that game pass actually really fucked up like achievement percentages were already really crazy. And I bet that game pass like lowered all those percentages even further because now you have people that don't buy the game that just cruise in, launch it once and go eh, and, and move away. Um, and so they never, you know, 43% of players reached level five. This is on the Xbox achievement. So this would be game pass. This would be on an Xbox. This would be PC with game pass, but not PC with steam. Um, which presumably would be the largest cohort of players. I suppose it's possible that steam sales outpaced game pass users, but that seems incredibly unlikely. Um, I got a message from Xbox. Back up your best gaming moments. Game captures on the Xbox network will be deleted after 90 days. Deletions start May 30th. Be sure to back up captures you want to save on OneDrive or on an external hard drive. To get started, click learn more below. I'm okay. I only ever used it to capture clips of bugs when I was reviewing a game. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, you know, that's, that's my problem with, with work like that, that happens after the fact is you have a lot of players who have like, in, in some cases I would say probably your most die hard players, your most fervent audience gets fucked the most. Because those are the ones that are going to go out and buy the premium edition of the game. Those are the ones who are going to go out and play the game uh, obsessively at launch. And those are the ones that are going to have the worst possible time with your game. Because all the patchwork you're doing. Um, a lot of those updates sound good. I, I, I read the list and, and, and you know see what Todd Howard is out there saying. You go like, oh yeah, man. 
Yes, that's all stuff that game could use. You've identified it. So did I when I played it at launch. When like, fucking come on. Um, so it's annoying. And, and that's something that I think that Bethesda has been really bad about for a while. That is something that they have definitely, you know, this is not the first time that, that that's been the case with their games. Uh, and I think that's incredibly frustrating. And you can chalk that up to like, that's the nature of video games, right? Everything gets patched. So everything, you know, you're never going to play the best version of a game day one. Or especially three days of early access is somehow an even bigger scam. But um, such is life. We like to play things when they're new. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a very natural uh, feeling to have about a media you care about. So, so I don't know. Um, this, I, I, if you're, you're probably watching this, this looks like it's still recording here, the archive, but, uh, some people are saying that they have, that they're getting some kind of network error. Uh, okay. Some people are saying that it's fine there. So it looks like some people that the stream died for them live, but, but I assure you, I am still here. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, emails here. Charlie in Essex writes in and says, were the conflict games actually good? Like Conflict Desert Storm, Conflict Desert Storm 2, Conflict Vietnam, and Conflict Global Terror? I'll just answer you right here. No. <laughs> uh, my friends and I loved them at the time on Xbox, but they're never talked about. We had hoped that they would be included in the push for backwards compatibility, but it never came to be. So were they actually good, good games or were they middle of the road shooters in an age of middle of the road shooters? Uh, they were middle of the road shooters in an, like they, those were games that felt like um, the conflict games were games that felt like they almost didn't belong on console. They were like trying to be this more tactical, uh, you know, the, the more of this uh, serious shooter but, um, but I, they always just felt so bad to me. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yes, I, I remember those games being absolutely middling at best. I guess is what I would say about the conflict, <laughs> the conflict. I have not thought about the conflict franchise in a while. Thank you. Um, John in Salt Lake says, with the rumors about the Switch 2 flying around, I'm curious, what was your favorite console to speculate about in the run-up before its details were officially released? Mine was probably the Wii, just because the rumors got so crazy, and then the reality was also crazy. Also, which one did you know the most about in advance of everyone else? Um, gosh. I think the Switch maybe was the... I think this, I, it's the, the Wii, I think was interesting because you found out the details because they announced them, you know, and, and you saw the screenshot of the controller, which you would maybe heard, you know, heard little bits and pieces about that the controller's weird, but never really specific. And then you see the picture of it and it's still hard to wrap your mind around what the heck is happening there. Like, you're like, what is this? What, what is this controller? What, how am I even supposed to use it? Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. The, 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 Wii was definitely a weird one. The switch was a weird one because again, because it was hard to wrap your mind around what it was they were doing. And then once you started hearing details about like, Hey, it's a handheld thing, but also it's a TV thing. You had a lot of questions about like, uh, okay, is it like the Wii U where the handheld is just a, a transmitter or just, you know, a dumb terminal, um, or is the, is the whole thing, is, is there power in the dock? That was ultimately, I remember sending that specific question to someone. I remember having a, a conversation with someone who was at a third party who had seen it uh, and was telling me about it. And even at that point, he didn't know. He was like, I, I think so. I don't actually know. Uh, you know, because, because that thing, 
for as for as much as the you know when they give us debugs they want them chained to a desk at that point they wanted dev kits to be chained in a room and then only people who were on a need to know basis were allowed in that room <laughs> um but uh yeah i don't know like I, that was definitely the 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 nintendo stuff i think is generally the the stuff that's people speculate the most about i i, I don't remember I think with the PlayStation 5, a lot of the speculation was around hearing details of backwards compatibility and hearing details around, oh, with the PlayStation 5, they, I remember the story going around for a little bit there was they really want to try to find a way to honor the full legacy of PlayStation by having it, you know, and by maybe having it being backwards compatible all the way back to the beginning and that any disc you put in it will run. And I remember at the time being like, that's fucking crazy. If I don't know how they pull that off, that would be broken because PlayStation three games are so weird. Um, the architecture required to do that would be strange. They could build emulators for one and two, three would be a little tricky, but not, not impossible. Um, and so then it was like, well, are they going to make it stream this stuff? Are they going to do this or that? You know, but there, there was a little, there was a little PlayStation five speculation there for a while, specifically around, um, it being fully backwards compatible all the way to the beginning of PlayStation. And that ended up not being the case, obviously, but like that was, I, I remember there being some very loose talk around that and then trying to piece that together and go like, how would they even do that? Like four, they could certainly do one and two were easy enough to emulate in software that they could totally do it if they wanted to. It was just a matter of like nailing down. How would they do three? Because emulating a PlayStation three at that point was not as well done as it is now. Like on a PC, PS3 games are fucking incredible these days. Um, like the compatibility is, is really, really sharp. So, you know, it, it would have potentially been doable. Um, but I don't really know. Uh, uh, Raul writes in and says, is Drake the fallout brotherhood of steel of rappers? No. No, no. Cause like fallout brotherhood of steel is like the forgotten console only offshoot of a beloved franchise right I mean that's not Drake is the call of duty of rappers he's the guy who sells really well but also the guy that anyone who is like really invested in the medium thinks is total shit and is a uh, commercial and overly commercial and that's how I think a lot of very dedicated video game players. That's exactly how they feel about Call of Duty. You know? Um, that sounds like more of a burn on Call of Duty than I intend it to be. But, but yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, I mean, Drake sold a lot of... You know, I didn't even sell a lot of records. Drake did a lot of streams. A lot of people clicked on songs by Drake, I guess. And lots of kids play it. Uh, Tommy from Florida writes in and says, each sport has one or two franchises dominating their market. And they're generally seen as complacent or lazy for riding the microtransaction cash cow. When does the bubble burst then? Does it ever? For all the shit people talk about wanting 2005 quality sports games, which is valid, Madden seems to sell like gangbusters every year. Um, so th this, th th this is a captive audience problem. This is a problem where it's very easy to complain about Madden and NBA 2K. Uh, those are probably the, the prime examples I feel for well, NBA more so, um, than even Madden, um, but if you like basketball and you want to play a basketball video game, what else? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? 
Do you like football? Do you want to play a video game that is football? Here's the one, here's the one game we have for you. Don't like it? Ah, eh, don't, you don't have to buy it, but you're gonna. And you're going to complain about it all season long. More so than you complain about how fucking dog shit your fantasy draft went or how fucking bad the, the Lions are playing this year or whatever the fuck else, right? Um, they have you. They don't have to make the games better because you keep buying them. Like, you know, so when you say, when, when does the bubble burst? When people stop buying the game. There's literally no reason for these games to improve meaningfully or change the way they're doing business, short of government intervention on some of these microtransactions. But there's no reason for that game to get better as long as you are buying it every year. If if the sales dropped a lot, then they would have to like they would have to look at that and go, what happened? They would have to look at it and go, like, what what went wrong here? Is it because of something we did, 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 is football not as popular? Is what, you know, they, they'd have to dig deep on what the fuck happened. And maybe they would eventually come to terms with like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, the game's been, you know, people have been mad about the game for a long time and they decided not to buy it. But this is similar to the same conversation that, you know, we have about uh, people um, who complain about like, say, a kernel level anti-cheat, but will happily go play those games anyway. You know, it's like, you're like, okay. The only message you can realistically send in these situations is, is I'm not buying this game that, uh, that a company in, in these sorts of positions will understand. Um, if you think that call of duty has fallen off, if you think that, you know, like then, then don't buy it. If you want those games to be better than, than I, these annual franchises that feel like they're the same thing or slightly worse year in year out the only way to send a message is to not play it. You know, for a free to play game, that's the, that's the message, right? Is like, don't spend time. Certainly don't spend money. Don't engage with it. Don't talk about it online. I wouldn't even complain about it. This is the same advice I would give to people that don't like things about wrestling. Um, the move is not to get online and complain about Chris Jericho. The move is to never talk about Chris Jericho. <laughs> the move is to have zero reaction to anything he's involved with and just be like, Ugh. the move is for the crowd to be dead when Chris Jericho has walked is, is, is out in front of the crowd. Um, and I think it's the same thing with video games. If you're out there complaining about it, you're still talking about it. There's still sentiment analysis happening. There's still conversation about the game. You're still in play. You're still someone who might buy that game because you're out there talking about it all the time. Just move on, get into something else and talk about that instead. I think that's, that's the only way to really send that type of message in, in those sorts of situations is to just be like, okay, this thing is not operating at a level that I'm happy with. And so I'm no longer going to engage with it. I'm not going to sit here and complain about Madden every day on Twitter or anything like that. I am just going to not play Madden and I'm going to move on. I'm now one number down on all of their charts. And if there are enough people in that bucket, where like, oh, really seems like online chatter about Madden's just kind of dying off. That's way more terrifying to them than people are mad about Madden because people who are mad about Madden are passionate about Madden, meaning they will probably buy Madden anyway. So I think if you, if you, if, if you want to send messages like that to about, about these kind of ongoing games, any sports game, not, you know, Madden, I'm just, I don't know, is Madden, people are mad about Madden, I assume, because pe people are mad about everything, but, but I know people have been mad about NBA 2K quite a bit, um, but as long as those games are selling and as long as the, you know, the microtransactions and cards or whatever else, as long as ultimate team is still doing numbers or whatever, they don't have to care. Why would they? You're still, you're still doing it. They hope that you're in a group chat about their game. And so if you're the one who decided you're not going to buy it that year, you're ostracized from a, your group. You know, you have to buy FIFA this year because what else are you going to do? That's the only thing that you and your friends talk about. You know, 
I think the only way on that stuff is to just disengage from it. Um, but, but I, and I am, I would say I'm guilty of this in some cases as well, but like, because that's a very human thing, uh, is, Hey, you also are going to play some stuff and, and be mad about it. <laughs> you know, you're going to buy it anyway because you like the thing just enough to where you're going to like, well, all right. Like the number of people that buy the WWE game every year. And then just go like, oh, it's the same fucking thing again. Um, they've been a little bit better lately, I guess, for some folks uh, in, in that particular case. But like, uh, I, I think that if you, if you are frustrated by a thing, if you think a thing is bad and you actually want it to get better, you have to be willing to not play the thing. And that's it. Um, and that means don't, don't play it when it hits Game Pass either. You know, like... Like, oh, it's on the EA Play free tier now, so now I'm going to go play Madden or, or whatever. That's still a number. That you become a person that they might convert into someone who buys it at launch next year or upsell a higher tier subscription to. You're still in play at that point. I think users have to completely fucking vanish off of their their telemetry. You know, their their numbers, their whatever. It just has to just, just be like, up. Oh, this many players vanished from our purview this year, and we don't know why. We need to figure out why. And if they come to the conclusion, hey, it's because people are mad because the fucking game sucks. Then maybe the maybe those developers get more resources. Maybe those developers get resources to make a better game and fix more the following year. You know, maybe the, the ultimate team stuff changes uh, some of its ways if the numbers go away. But like, that's not how it's going. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like in, until stuff like that happens, you're not sending a message to the, you know, like getting online and being like, I'm mad about this. Like, okay, cool. You're still, still playing it. Still mad about it. That's good. You're passionate about the thing. Uh, let's see. Steven from Adelaide, Australia writes and says, where are all the caveman games? <laughs> God damn it. Where are all the caveman games? Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, used to be a lot of super bonks and Joe and Mac and Chuck rocks around. Where have all the prehistoric men gone? Is the world ready for a caveman ninja souls? Like you know, in the nineties, cavemen were very popular. Uh, the, the comic strip BC hadn't become some weird fundamentalist nightmare. Uh, you know, cavemen were all over television. You had that ad campaign that turned into a television show. That bastion of creativity. Um, you know, the Flintstones were still kind of on the air. Uh, more than they probably are now. And uh, cavemen were just a fixture. But nowadays, you just don't have that. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Fibosh, in the ch Fibosh in the chat asks the, the relevant question here. Is Horizon a caveman game? Kinda. It's, it's post-caveman, right? I mean, they're out of the caves building cities, but... Um, Yes, no, I mean, Captain Caveman, I always thought was a cool cartoon character. But there ain't, ca yeah, you just, you, there ain't cavemen anymore. And they're not mascots. They're not cool mascots anymore either. So, yeah, are a lot of survival games basically caveman games? I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess in a lot of ways we're just fucking... I guess we're just building the caves ourselves, right? Um, we're punching holes into mountains and building caves. We're punching trees to get the sticks. We are all cavemen now. Weird. That's fucking heavy. Uh, 
Oh, let's see here. Vivian in Vermont writes in and says, another gaming podcast I listen to likes to joke that the Persona series starts at three. For as silly as that is, yeah, uh, there is some merit to the argument that franchises gain real cultural relevance with entries far from the first. What are some games you would say are the start of these series? Uh, and then, and then Vivian lists a, a bunch of, um, a bunch of franchises for us to go through, but yeah, I, yes. I mean, yeah, that happens. I mean, games certainly catch on later. That's uh that's definitely a thing, whether they get brought to a new platform or, or whatever the, the, the case may be, um, you know, as generations change and games become more elaborate, like that's certainly possible. I get why someone would say that the persona series starts at three. Um, because yeah, I mean, modern persona is based on all of the stylistic stuff that they started in three. <clears throat> I like Persona 1. I did anyway. I I it's probably a game I would fucking really be frustrated by if I went back to it right now and tried to play it. But at the time, I I really did like the first Persona. Uh it was it was neat. It was high school kids and you could talk to the monsters. You're like, "What the fuck is happening here? This is ridiculous. It's a great game." I would say the Persona series starts and ends at 4. How about that? If we just want to make claims, if we, if we just want to say shit, uh, how about that? Uh, anyway, Vivian provided a list here. Grand Theft Auto. I think obviously Grand Theft Auto starts at three. Um, I played a lot of GTA one and two, but I, you know, yeah, I mean, GTA really starts at three. You could maybe even argue it starts at vice city, but, uh, but yes, three was a three was the biggest game in the world at the time. Uh, Call of Duty, it's four. You know, no no big surprise there. I I you know for as much as Call of Duty two was a really big deal for PC players, uh, four was where that be. If, if Call of Duty four changed video games. Assassin's Creed, I'd probably say two. I would probably say Assassin's Creed starts at two, if not Brotherhood, but really two. Um, and that's not to say that Assassin's Creed one was a bad game. It was really cool in its day. Uh, I liked the first one as well, but it, it just kind of, uh, I think a lot of that style of Assassin's Creed shored up in the, uh, in the AC two games that happened around there and that and Brotherhood and, and, and that before you know before three and then it ended at three then three came out and you're like all right well i guess that's that um tony hawk's pro skater i think that started at one i i, I that game was wildly popular and it continued to be popular on the playstation 2 uh and then eventually it fell off but like yeah i'd say one tekken tekken I mean, I, Tekken 1 was a massive game for PlayStation. Tekken 3 came out at a time when there were way more PlayStation 1s out there. And so it probably, I'm sure that that was a much more widespread game because of how big it was at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I would probably say Tekken 3... It's either Tekken 3 or it's Tekken Tag because Tekken Tag launched alongside the PlayStation 2 and kind of ushered in, you know, the, that generation of consoles. Um, but I feel like Tekken has been rather even uh, over the course of its run. But uh, there's stuff about Tekken 1 and 2 in terms of character movement and and what's it's like the sidesteps and how you get up. And like there are just parts of, of the early Tekken games that, that are missing some of that that makes it a little harder to go back to these days. Fallout. Remember Fallout? Remember when they said, hey, we're, we've acquired the rights to make a new Fallout game and we're going to make, a, make it a first-person game? Remember how fucking mad people were? 
Yeah, no mutants allowed. Doesn't no mutants allowed probably still exists. There's probably people in there that are still just like, Rrr! I'm not gonna watch the TV show because the camera is down here instead of up here. You know. Um, but yeah, I think you know. Obviously, Fallout Three bought, brought that franchise to an entirely new group of people and made it an entirely different thing and made it way bigger than it ever was previously. Fallout 1 and 2 were incredibly well regarded in their era, you know, by by PC players. That was a case where like I was I was covering console games pretty exclusively at the time and did not spend time with the first two Fallout games. People talked about them being good and whatever else and and I was just like, "Okay, cool man. Like I'll maybe I'll play that someday." And then never really never really gave those games a look uh in in their original era anyway. Um but yeah, Fallout 3. Uh, for Street Fighter, it's Street Fighter 2. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Street Fighter 2. It ain't Street Fighter 1, that's for sure. Halo. I would probably say Halo 2 because it added the online multiplayer. And that that's the thing that people want out of Halo these days is, is you know, is that competitive multiplayer. Um, I, I might also just say Halo 3, though, because the, the, the multiplayer offering rounded out so well in Halo 3 that Halo 3 is really kind of, I think, the high point for a lot of that franchise. Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm Halo 3 might be the better answer there, but but Halo 2 technically did a lot of that stuff too. Um Dance Dance Revolution. I would say Third Mix is where Dance Dance Revolution really kind of hit its stride. Um Second Mix is still really good, but I I think Third is is probably the um Yeah, I'd say third mix. I'd say third mix, I guess. Fire Emblem. Ah, you know, one of these days, Fire Emblem's gonna get one that starts the franchise. We'll see. I don't know. They keep putting out a lot of these games, but w one of these days, they'll put out a good one, and then, then we'll be off to the races. But uh, until then, you know, we'll, we'll have to just wait and see. Um, Let's see. Maybe we'll take one more here. Uh, Nick from Iowa writes in and says, I'm sure as an important businessman and father of three, you don't have a whole lot of time for watching streamers on Twitch. When you do, would you prefer, this almost sounds like a survey question. <laughs> when you do, would you prefer to watch people playing games you know and love or playing games you've not played or heard of? Related follow-up, do you like watching people playing stuff they're good at, like pro gamers or speedrunners, or people playing through something for the first time? Hmm. I like seeing games that I am not aware of, I guess, is what I would say. Um, if I'm going to watch a game that I am familiar with, then it has to be them doing something weird whether that's a speed run or a tool assisted thing or uh, you know, someone doing something strange with a game. If it's something that I have already played, right? Um, um, but you know, you, you watch Twitch for the people. You, you watch Twitch because you like a person and what they do. I, it, it's, I don't necessarily, um, Yeah, I, you know, I, I I I look for for individual folks, some of whom I know and communicate with elsewhere, and some some I don't, I guess. But um, there's I, I guess there's really no one I watch regularly that I don't like talk to in some other capacity. Now that I think about it, there's there's not like a ton of stuff that I'm um that I'm that I'm watching all the time. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, yeah, it's, but I, but I, I like watching, um, I like watching, I don't know, like people playing old games that I'm like, 
aware of but maybe not familiar with that that i actually do like doing in those cases of just like this is a game i know this is a or this is a game i know exists it's a game that i maybe spent 10 minutes with or maybe have never actually played let's see what it's all about like i think that's kind of cool and kind of useful at times um but yeah i, I don't i don't necessarily spend a ton of time hunting around and seeing what different people out there streaming are doing sometimes I, occasionally i will but um but that's that's pretty rare i don't know usually i just kind of watch the people i watch and uh and those people don't stream all that often so i don't spend a ton of time um watching stuff i'm interested in people that are streaming great games with great music you know like mr dew's castle uh that's my primary interest i would say but, uh, but that's just me. Anyway, that's going to do it for the program. Thanks everybody for hanging out. I, this is this whole, obviously the layoff story is not new. It is not something that just happened this morning. This has been ongoing for a very long time, but there's something about this. And I don't mean, and I'm not even, this isn't, <laughs> I, I did not like Redfall and I also am not a massive like Dishonored fan or, or, or other stuff like that. So it's it's kind of this weird situation. Um, But that doesn't mean I think that those games should just never happen again and, and all of that. Obviously, well, you know, hey, maybe Leon maybe Leon gets back to Dishonored 3 someday since that was kind of, the, that kind of became their thing as the franchise went on. The Tango stuff is really frustrating because Hi-Fi Rush was cool and um, a fun surprise in a year that needed one on a console that needed a fun surprise like that. Honestly, uh, that game won awards and apparently that wasn't good enough to keep them around. And yeah, this stuff just, it, this, this stuff feels way worse than the, the layoffs have felt lately. Um, I think because of that, because of the quality of something like a hi-fi rush or something like it just, it just feels like, what, what are you even doing? Uh, it's deflating. Uh, it, it, it feels very rotten. I don't feel good is what I'm saying. Like, uh, it gives me bad feeling. Um, that's going to do it for the program. I'll be back. Um, you know, streaming Wednesdays and Fridays, typically. 10 a.m. Pacific time, playing some video games, I suppose. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks everybody. We'll be back on Tuesday with another episode of the podcast. Head over to the Patreon, and uh, you know, keep the keep the crank turning over there. Patreon.com/slash Jeff Gersman got multiple tiers with hot content for you to see. A Discord you can get on, and then we can continue to talk about some of this layoff stuff i suppose um but yeah thanks for hanging out and i'll see you soon bye my drink was in the way of the button i need to push stop on there we go here we go here we go bye <laughs>